at the end of time. Thirteen. O'clock. <laughs> What's up, you guys? Hey, yeah. Jamie's fucking with me. I'm fucking with you. I'm yeah. always fucking with you. Yeah. That's just how. That's just how I roll. Yeah, that's just how I roll. I came over here and says I'm getting this video. She goes, you never know what kind of video you're gonna be in. Because I was trying Scooting to get into the yeah, next yeah, door. Yeah. I, said, I don't know, man. I might be next door in some kind of gay video. And she goes, you'd love it. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah. I'm like, don't even complain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Don't even complain. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, um, as everyone is pointing out, yes, R.I.P. Tina Turner died today. She was, what, 82, 83, something like that. Live a full life. Hang out with David Bowie now. Yeah, they're all in yeah, heaven all together. Hang out, all hang I mean, out. I don't believe in heaven, but you know what I mean. <laughs> it's like, that. maybe they're somewhere. They're in the Pleroma someplace. They're in the Pleroma, yeah. Like, being cool and hanging yeah. out together. With Vincent Price, who was, yeah. you know, the subject of uh, tonight's show. Vincent Price, another guy that lived a very very full life and i feel like people that only know him from his horror movies and don't get me wrong i love his fucking horror movies but it's like holy shit the dude he's like the epitome when i think about you know how people say it's like oh you know um you know a life well lived or man that dude like lived the best life or whatever vincent price is that guy he's that guy i mean he just i don't know he's he's a fucking legend man and it's like and he's and he did so much other stuff other than just being an actor. Yeah. And the cool thing about him is that literally I watched a bunch of documentaries about him and stuff like that. They can't find a single fucking person that will say anything bad about him. Everyone said he was just a delightful human being at all times. I even watched, you remember that show that they used to have? I don't remember what channel it was on, but it's called Mysteries and Scandals with that AJ Benza dude. Uh, no. And uh, yeah, so some of you guys might remember yeah. And they had one about Vincent Price, and it's on YouTube, and I'm like, what kind of mysteries and scandals could there be about Vincent Price? I never heard anything bad about him. And it's like, so I was like, so I gotta watch it. So I watched it, and it's like the mysteries and scandals they had in there, I was like, kind of a reach. Kind of a reach. I said, so that just goes to tell you right there that they really couldn't find anything, like, sorted or anything like that about him. It's like everyone was just like, nope, he was just awesome, so. Vincent Price is really not even, like, a Gen X thing. I, I even I don't even think if he because a lot of our generation know who he is but don't know much about him personally. It's just some dude you saw in a horror movie. I don't even think a lot of the boomer, even boomers, think it's like pre-boomer, wouldn't he? Vincent Price is yeah. one of those guys that transcends generations. Yeah, because he worked steadily in movies, TV, radio, voiceover work, everything like that from the '30s up and almost up until he died in the '90s. Um, yeah. He was always working, yeah. and he and it seems like he got rediscovered by each new generation. Like yeah. so, it almost seems like, and like I said, we've talked about this before, where horror is kind of a genre where, like, even if the shit's old, like you know, horror fans are going to be like all about it. So I kind of feel like maybe that helped. I do get the sense, and a lot of actors have this because we talked about this when we did the show about uh, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, is that you know when you're an actor, particularly when you're kind of like classically trained or you're a theater actor, like uh, you know Vincent Price was, then you know you kind of get typecast and he got typecast in horror movies i don't think he really complained about it over much but you could see that you know he wanted to do other things like not just horror movies as much as he loved doing horror movies and playing villains and stuff like that because that was kind of his thing but um you do get kind of limited but on the other hand had he done just other kinds of movies and not horror movies, I'm not sure he would, I'm, you know, he'd still be remembered obviously because he's a great actor, but I think if you're in horror movies, it just gives you that leg up, you know what I mean? Because horror movies, like I said, kind of transcend generation and each new generation like discovers the classics all over again. All I knew of him is that he was a dude you saw in horror movies. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know much about the guy. But uh, it turns out that no, there was a lot, a lot more to him. You know what I mean? He wasn't just an actor. Dude came from money too. Uh, he did, yeah. And uh, was real popular. He was evidently like fucking like like Jenny said. Everybody liked him. He was just a cool dude, and he did a bunch of stuff. And Jenny's collected all the, all the little details about him. 
all kind of uh, fascinating stuff yeah. about him, about his life. Right. I mean, uh, probably not too many American actors are like this guy. This guy is almost kind of like, he'd strike me like sim- more similar to a British actor, kind of like Peter Cushing or fucking old. What's yeah, his name? he could definitely hang with those. Yeah, dudes. you know what was the other guy? Um, Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee, he kind of like that, you know, or um, you know, he just. I guess you could say he was kind of a kind of a scenester too, you know. Yeah. Um, almost kind of like a, what was that guy's name? Fucking, oh, it doesn't matter. You can go. I was just going to make an analogy. He's kind of like the actor version of fucking, uh, um, uh, man. Describe him. Oh, Blue Eyes, singer. Uh, Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. He's kind of like an actor version of Sinatra. Yeah, Vincent Price, he had a lot very, of and shit. yeah, like very, um, yeah. urbane. Yeah. I think is the best word. And Tammy said elegant. He was very elegant. And the thing about it that's funny, it's like I was reading some of the comments like underneath some of the documentaries about him that are on YouTube. And it seems like a lot of people, particularly younger people, like they had seen Vincent Price like in movies and stuff. And they're like, oh my God, I love Vincent Price and all this other kind of stuff. But a lot of them thought he was British. Yeah. I'm like, no, he's not. Not only is he American, he's Midwestern. He's from yeah. St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> well, he kind of had kind of a gravitas to him. So he kind of came across like he was a British actor. Because yeah, like, yeah. And he did um, study in, uh, you know, yeah. he, he did, like, do some uh, stage work in London. So. Another funny thing about him is that he could be silly, too, and he could be silly really straight Yeah, he did comedies. And, 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 yeah, uh, he could be silly, but he could also be silly in a horror movie and just play the shit really straight, and it would kind of be scary and silly at the same time. Um, he, um, he, he was just, he had his own little character. He was, you know, he was a phenomenon. Yeah, and like I said, yeah. not too many actors, particularly ones that started in the 1930s, um, are as recognizable. Like I said, you can go up to, like, a teenager, and they fucking know who yeah. Vincent Price is. Yeah. Or you can go up to, like, a super old person, and they know who Vincent Price is. What's kind of forgotten about Price, though, is uh, most people remember Price middle-aged and old when he was playing villains and shit. People... People forgot how good looking he was when he was looking young. Man, what a good looking really, motherfucker! He yeah, was. I he mean, was, he was good looking when he was old too. <laughs> yeah, he just got more sinister kind of looking when he was young. He looked like a real tall, better looking version of Marlon Brando. Yeah, he looked better than Brando. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I thought he was better looking than Brando yeah. like back in the day. I like Brando though. Brando had yeah, a, I did kind as of a well. toughness to him. You know, sometimes at least he seemed tough. He wasn't, you know, and he he did a lot of great movies, man. You know, fucking Apocalypse Now and. Uh, you know, fucking wild one. Mr. 88 said he had one of the two or three most recognizable voices ever. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why he did so much work. Yeah. I mean, he he even did, um, he did some voice for, like, The Great Mouse Detective, that uh, animated film that did Disney the voice film from, over 80, for fucking, from 80. Did the voiceover for Michael Jackson's Thriller. Thriller. Yeah, he sang on, yeah. uh, Alice Cooper. He did some stuff yeah. with Alice Cooper. I think he worked with, uh, Deep Purple. Yeah. So he did, like, all kind of stuff. He was just, he just seemed like he was so just restlessly creative and he just like yeah. always have and you know he just seemed to have this kind of just joy he just really yeah. wanted to like live life to the fullest you know what I mean and everybody that I listened to that talked about him said that about him yeah that it's like he just loved life he was doing fucking experimental horror movies where they were mixing like British style hammer horror flicks with, mixed with like 60s psychedelic with, and horror with Dr. F- the the abominable Dr. Fives, that was, or Phoebes, that we call it? It's Fives. Fives, yeah. Uh, he, he was fucking Fibes great. He was great Fibes. in that. And that was, that was We saw that was about a year ago, wasn't it? Just, well, um, it might have been two years ago, because it was when Sophie okay. was here, but okay. at the old house. At the old so house. it was okay. probably like two years ago. Yeah, it was just this fucking weird, psychedelic, 60s horror flick, real colorful, kind of LSD-inspired, it seemed like <laughs> Dude running around killing people like a serial killer. I think that was like one of his favorite roles. I think. Yeah, it's kind of like an evil version of Batman. You know, he was uh, he played a villain on the Batman series too, like the the (laughs) cheesy one with Adam West. He played uh, Egghead. What? Egghead. I don't. I didn't see that. Yeah, where he had like this kind of big bald, and he kept making like egg related puns all the time. It's pretty great. I wouldn't mind watching that old series. I haven't seen it in a long time. I liked it when I was a kid. Yeah, I liked it when I was a kid. I'd probably still like it. It's probably funny. It probably is, yeah. yeah. I heard that it was like a hit show. Adults were watching. Yeah, yeah. It was it was supposed to be funny. You know, it was just a, a, go, a goofy show and people Yeah, it's like, campy. Can't, yeah. Sabrina said, didn't he also make his own cookbook? Yeah, he actually, um, him and his second wife, uh, Mary Grant, uh, Mary Vincent, 
she um they they did a bunch of cookbooks actually and vincent price actually had in the uk i don't know if i don't think they ever showed it over here but he had like a six episode like cooking mini series that was called cooking price wise mm -hmm. and he had a um a book that went with that but yeah the, i think the book um the big main book that they did which is like a treasury of american recipes or something like i said they did more than one it went out of print for a while but i think um that it got reprinted in 2015 like they started putting it back out again and that was mostly because of his daughter victoria who kind of like oversees his um you know all of his re-releases of his movies and his books and stuff like that she like yeah. you know curates his legacy uh, essentially is what she does yeah and uh, she seems like a lovely person also when i was a kid i would sometimes confuse vincent price with max von Sado. Mm. you know what i mean i would get him confused sometimes they looked alike to me when I was a kid. I get, they do a little bit, I guess. When I was a kid, I, I thought they were, I'd get them confused. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, subjective Perspective says, uh, uh, Collective, sorry, I missed yeah. that. Uh, highly recommend Mask of the Red Death. You know, if I had to pick my favorite Vincent Price movie, that would probably be it. But it's kind of hard because he was in so many. And I haven't seen them all. Like, I've probably seen... 90% of the horror movies he's been in but you know as many of you are pointing out he was in like a shit ton of other movies he didn't really start getting into horror movies until like well he was in one in 1939 um, and he was in like the sequel to the invisible man so he was in that but he didn't really like take off as like a horror star until house of wax which was 1953 so prior to that he'd kind of been he's like a character actor he he mostly did like period pieces noir films that type of stuff dramas he did some comedies and stuff like that as well um because he was actually very funny and actually everybody that knew him said that he was like just a funny dude just like on the yeah. set you know what i mean i gotta say i think my favorite movie with him in it was last man on earth yeah that's a good one i mean there's, yeah. so that's what i mean it's like so hard to pick like i said if you put a gun in my head and tell me you have to pick your favorite benson price movie it would probably be mask of the red death but yeah. there are so many and there were some good Edgar Allan Poe ones that he was in. Remember when he's, uh, yeah, he was, I think he was, I think he was with Peter Laurie and they're do, doing magic fights. Yeah, that was Peter the Raven. Laurie, the Raven. Boris Karloff was in that too. Boris Karloff was in it too. Yeah, that was a good one. And he was in Pit and the Pendulum. Yeah. And he, he was in, uh, he was in Tomb of Lygia too, yeah. I think. Yeah, he did a bunch of the Roger Corman ones, which I, like I said, those are my favorites. I love all those Roger Corman like Poe adaptations. They're just, it's amazing to me that they were filmed for like no money. But they're still just these beautiful... They're classics. Yeah, they're just like these classic films. It's so fucking great. Yeah, some uh, people are talking about Laura, which I've actually been wanting to see. You know what I watched last night? So here's what I did. Last night, I was like, well, I want to watch a Vincent Price movie. I was like, it could either be one that I haven't seen before, because there's a lot of those, or, you know, one that I've seen, but not for a really long time. So, you know, in preparation for the show. So I go on Amazon Prime, and they had a bunch that, you know, that we just covered like not too long like they had theater of blood and stuff like that which i think we just reviewed sometime this year so they had a bunch of those and i was like okay well they had and then i thought they had pit and the pendulum and the raven and i was like ooh, maybe i can watch both of those but it said they had them but then i clicked on them and they didn't have them so they said unavailable i was like all right what the fuck is that all about however they did have one that i had heard mentioned that i'd never seen before one of his early films and it's called shock i think it's from 1946 it's not a horror horror movie. It's more like a thriller. Um, but man, I got really into it. Um, and I had never seen it before. And I feel like it's one that a lot of people don't bring up. And it's a, it's a role where he's, um, I mean, he essentially plays this dude who kills his wife um, in their hotel apartment or whatever. And this other girl woman who's staying in the hotel like sees it like ac from across the way like from her window and the girl you know the the woman goes into shock and she you know and then it turns out that like the psychiatrist that comes to tend to her because of her shock-based amnesia is vincent price who killed his wife so it's just like this whole thing so he's like trying to maybe make her forget what she saw and like the husband is sitting there going what is this kind of treatment that you're doing and he's like yeah we're gonna do insulin shock we're gonna do and then it's like maybe we should kill her too and all this other kind of shit because he's also like banging the nurse or whatever which is one of the things that made him kill the wife so it's great it's like he's really really good in it like as a villain but he's not like it's pretty subdued you know what i mean it's not like real campy or anything like that because it's like one of his earlier roles so he's like evil in it but like he also toward the end gets like starts to regret 
You know what I mean? So he's not just like a cackling villain. He's just kind of like, he does all this stuff and then he's like, oh shit, maybe I shouldn't have done that. You know what I mean? So he's like a little bit reluctant. Um, thank you so much, Subjective Perspective Collective. Uh, love this topic. I'm trying to own every price film. 211, I believe. Damn. He Hashtag made... goals. He was in a lot. Damn. And not only that, but I think he made over 2,000 television appearances. Mm. Um, and that doesn't count like all his voiceover work and all the stuff he did for radio and all that kind of stuff. I mean, the dude, and like, I was, you know, there's extensive interviews with his daughter who also um, wrote a biography of him that came out um, several years ago. And she's like, he was basically always working. And he didn't, he didn't seem to have any distinction between, it's like, well, that's why he was in like kind of these quote unquote B movies, which, you know, seems that's a little dismissive phrase to use, but that's the phrase that they would have used back then. And I think a lot of people would have said, oh, you know, an actor of your caliber, like, what are you doing in these, like, cheapy, you know, American International pictures and all that kind of stuff. But he just really liked to work. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, he did a movie. Yeah. I mean, he basically just said the only thing that makes him think that, like, oh, my career's on a downturn is if I'm, like, not working. Yeah. So he would, pr and he would, like, later on, he would be in commercials. He was in, like, print ads. He was on the Muppets. Like everybody saw the I, that was great. I still remember. I that can't believe I he kid. actually didn't do the voices and the voiceovers in in uh, Disney's Haunted Mansion. He did. You know what? He did um, for the Paris one. Okay. Like he did the voiceover for that. In but Paris. They, yeah. Yeah, but they didn't use it for long because then they decided, oh, well, they're gonna go with um, one that's all in French because right. he did it all in English. Okay. Yeah. Um, but they kept his laugh. So I think if you still go to the Haunted Mansion in Paris, like they still yeah. have like Vincent Price's laugh. Because it on follows. There. It should have been. Vince Price, yeah, doing the voiceover to the to the ride. I, even though the dude that does it is really good, I know I love that. But too. Vince Price, really every time I hear that guy's voice, because yeah. he did a lot of voiceover work too. Yeah. That guy, I can't remember what his name is, but he did a lot of uh, voiceover work too. And it's like every time I hear it, it's like I always hear the fucking automation shit. Yeah, <laughs> so great. Uh, yeah, Mr. Eighty Eight said Laura is the most acclaimed film I can think of that he was in. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, he got like a lot of um, that probably I don't know want to. I don't know if I'd say that was his breakout role. He seemed to have, like, a lot of those. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Mr. 88 said, I wonder how many radio dramas he was in. I would uh, guess hundreds. Of, yeah, like a shit ton. I don't even know if anybody, like, I'm sure somebody has counted, but. Um, oh, and Mango t recommends Dragonwick, which I actually, I was going to watch that one again because I saw that when I was probably, like, a teenager. And I remember really liking it, but I haven't even seen it, seen it since then. So I was going to watch that, but then I found Shock instead. And I said, oh, I haven't seen this one. And I had just, like, read something about it. So I watched that one instead. And I ended up really, really liking that one. Even though I think that one was fairly low budget. But like I said, it was, you know, like a, more like a thriller. You know, it was like a murder mystery noir type of thing. Um, yeah, they're talking about thriller. Well, yeah. I heard, I don't know if this is true or not. I heard that he didn't get paid for that. I don't know if he just didn't get paid or if they just paid him like a paltry sum and then the the album was like the biggest selling album of ever and then they didn't like cut him off a piece even though he's like the best part about it. Doesn't that make song. sense that he wasn't paid. That's what I mean. So yeah, I did, I didn't really know if that was true or not. I just heard that somewhere and I was just kind of like, I don't know, that doesn't sound like He also doesn't strike me as a Michael Jackson fan for the time either. Just like he'd do it for free. Uh, probably yeah. not. They, they, but they paid him. I'm sure it's probably just a rumor. Yeah, maybe. He probably just got a regular paycheck, for what he considered to be a regular paycheck for it. Yeah. Which may not have been much. Maybe you know, not. That's probably what for... they're talking about. How would he know that was going to be a big hit? Well, yeah, I think that's kind of what the yeah. implication was, was yeah. that they just gave him, it's like, hey, we'll give you X amount of dollars for doing this voiceover. And then... And he's like, oh, in a music video? Oh, Whatever, right. okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, like I said, he was rolling, like, he worked with Alice Cooper and Deep Purple and stuff yeah. like that. So he was, he was kind of like, you know, hip and cool and like yeah. up on the, you know what I mean? He wasn't like a regular old man that was like, oh, these kids today with the yeah. music and... Music <laughs> Nobody will see it. He seemed... He seemed like he was really kind of uh, far ahead of the curve, which, like I said, I think that's why he keeps appealing to each new generation, because he just doesn't seem like he doesn't seem to belong to any particular era, really. Yeah. You know what dude, I mean? I'll tell you one thing about that dude. He was tall, much yeah. taller than you think. He was probably 6'6", six, six, wasn't he? Six, I four. think he was 6'4". 6'4"? Six, 6'4". Four. Six, four. Mm -hmm. yeah, fucking huge. Tall. Tall, skinny dude. Yeah, he was a big fucker. Yeah. He wasn't and that it, skinny. He was pretty, you know, but he was... He wasn't in a bodybuilder or anything, but uh, he wasn't a beanpole either. He was a big dude. 
Yeah, which, so I was yeah. watching that movie Shock last night, and there's one scene where he like yeah. walks across the house like to answer the door, and I'm just like, God, he's a big fucker. Yeah. I was like, well, I knew how tall he was, but it's like he looked really tall in that fucking scene. It just yeah. like fucking, which would have made him a lot taller than um, dude to play Frankenstein. Boris Karloff. Boris Karloff. Kar- Karloff wasn't six four. No, I don't even think Boris Karloff was six foot. I don't remember how tall Boris Karloff was. I mean, obviously he looked big as Frankenstein's yeah. monster, but that's because they put the yeah, big shoes, shoes on. and yeah, big fake uh, shoulder pads on. Anna, I saw like a little uh, tribute to Vincent Price, like somebody did on YouTube, and at the very beginning of it, they had a clip from the Red Skelton show that had Vincent Price and Boris Karloff like riding in on the stage in a car, and then they were like singing a song together about how how monstrous they were. It was adorable. Yeah, it was adorable. Because he, I mean, the thing about Vincent Price that was cool too is that. You know, he um, he always had a sense of humor about himself. Like, he was very willing to, like, parody, uh, you know, just, like, make light of all the characters that he played and stuff like that. Because he would always do these little kind of jokes where he would turn up. Like, you know, he was, like, he was on that Canadian TV show, like, The Hilarious House of Frightenstein, which a lot of people remember fondly. I don't, so we didn't have it here, but uh, Canadians fucking love it. I think it was, like, some local TV station in Ontario or something. And he, I hadn't seen you in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Tammy said Karloff was 5'11". 5'11", okay. Yeah, yeah. so not uh, that he, much shorter, but... Yeah, he wasn't six feet. Somewhat though. shorter. Yeah. Yeah. He um, looked tall, though, because he was slender. Especially, like, in the in, in the Black Cat with him and Boris, Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi. Uh, one of, that's actually my favorite Karloff and Lugosi movies, The Black Cat, back in the 30s. With the damn satanic ex-military commander sacrificing his unit to consecrate the ground, to build his fucking futuristic satanic mansion and dead women in refrigeration I guess they were on ice or something and all this damn necrophilia and stealing people's daughters that was a wild flick man pre Hayes code pre Hayes code yeah. they made some crazy shit back crazy right in the shit, 30s <laughs> and uh, he looked tall Karloff did in that it was the clothes and the angles and that, the, that art deco black and white way they kind of shot it it looked really fucking cool Spooky. Spooky and futuristic for the, for the time. Yeah. Great yeah, that, movie. That's a cool-ass movie. I can watch that movie over and over again. That's a cool-ass movie. Yeah. Well, it's one of my favorite horror films of the 30s. Yeah. I was just... It's funny because I was just watching a video uh, right before the show started where um, a guy was choosing his ten top 10 favorite horror films from the 30s. And though, I, like, most of the ones he picked were, like, totally legit picks. But, yeah, yeah Black Cat was totally on there. Yeah. Like, you know... Imagine and, if that was Vincent Price instead of Karloff Price could have probably done a good job yeah yeah I mean there was always something like I said there's always something about Vincent Price and it's funny because you know like I said I'm interested to like read the comments like underneath all the documentaries about him and stuff that are on YouTube and a lot of people are like oh man he scared me so much as a yeah. kid yeah. which is hilarious because everyone said he was like the nicest dude ever and it's funny because a lot of people say the same things about like Peter uh, Peter Cushing or like Christopher yeah. Lee or something like that. It's like they always played like these monsters or like horrific and not so much Peter Cushing, but um, you know because he played he played know, everything. Helsing and stuff too. Yeah. But I mean Christopher Lee and everything like that, and everybody that meets them and said he was just the the most generous, wonderful, genuine, down to earth person, and he's just like you would never think that he plays all these villainous roles. And I wonder if that's because you get like all your bad shit out playing villains and then there's just nice stuff left so like in your regular life you're just a nice person (laughs) because i hear that about a lot of people that play really horrible villains and stuff like that they it's it's like you meet them in real life and they're absolutely nothing like that they're like the sweetest people ever well it's like michael rucker michael rucker plays yeah yeah, yeah. he's friendly mississippi guy yeah Uh, uh, Even though he plays these like horrific, he played like yeah. Henry, like Henry, Henry Portrait of a serial Lewis, killer, like, and, like <laughs> Marl Dixon. Marl and, Dixon and yeah, shit. He's nothing like that. <laughs> but I th- and I think I think I think what it is. I don't think it has anything to do with the roles. I think what it is is that uh, certain people get elevated in the career because they're easy to work with behind the scenes. Like, okay, here, here's a good example. It's not horror. Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood had a fucking reputation for being this badass gunslinger, hard, you know, dirty Harry, and fucking, you know, High Plains Drifter, which is a fucking badass supernatural paranormal flick. That's like The Crow from fucking the Old West, but a lot of people don't realize it. But Yeah, it's like an Old West version of yeah, The Crow. Yeah, it's the Old West version of The Crow. It's about people a don't realize it. He, He's a revenant. He's come back from the dead. Yeah. All right. 
uh, to bring the town to hell. That's fucking great shit. But anyway, you would think that with his fucking movie selection that Clint Eastwood would be a badass. No. Clint Eastwood was a sweetheart. That's yeah. why they that's why they hired him. He was not egotistical or arrogant at all and was real quiet and was real polite and just did exactly what he was told on set. And it was just like he was like an extra. He didn't walk around like he was a star. He was almost like they said he was like working with an extra. See, that's the thing, because look, yeah. nobody I don't care how big a fucking star you are. Nobody wants to deal with your fucking ass yeah. walking around thinking your shit don't stink and yeah. you're the king of the fucking world. Yeah. Nobody wants to deal with that. Yeah. So that's how, that's the reason why, one of the main reasons why Clint Eastwood became a star and, and the reason why you know him. He looked great on camera with like Hang Em High. That's, and, and, uh, and some of the uh, fucking Sergio Leone movies, he just looked fucking great. That was like the main thing. But the support, the reason why he went over the top and, and had such a huge career is because everybody could work with him. Everybody liked working with him. Because he was just too just laid back. And it was like dealing with an extra. Yeah. He didn't have to deal with any kind of superstar ego. Yeah, because like I said, nobody wants to deal yeah. with that. Zach said, and then there's Tom Cruise. Yeah. Yeah, then there's Tom Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the exact same thing yeah, if it's any yeah. consolation. Yeah. Zach. Well, he, Tom Cruise, like, uh, he, he just pushes it through. He, he, he breaks the asshole boundary. And, <laughs> and all of a sudden, once you, it's like breaking a sound barrier. Once you go through it, it's all easy now. He's such an asshole that he just gets anything he wants. It's just like, yeah. He's like, he broke the sound it's barrier. It's kind of like an asshole <laughs> Ouroboros. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you, <laughs> once you break through it, it now just becomes like, you know, a bonus or something. It becomes, it becomes a strength. Yeah. That's hysterical. Yeah. But yeah, I never, like I said, I never heard a single person. He's almost kind of like Mr. Rogers in that way. I never heard a single person say a say boo or a bad word about Vincent Price. Everybody just said he was a delightful, delightful man uh, at all times. I've never heard anybody say a bad thing. Well, I'm sure somebody has somewhere because that's like really hard to find somebody on earth that somebody hasn't said something bad about. But I couldn't find anybody saying anything bad about him. They just all said he was a wonderful, wonderful person. And he sounds like a wonderful person. Like I said, he sounds like pretty fucking rad. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Tammy said, yeah, Clint was a pretty boy in his day. Yeah, yeah he was slender, though. He kind of had a hard look. and He had real good eyes. He had a real good profile. He could play a good cowboy. And, uh... He wasn't very. It was funny because in the movies, you know, like, I, and I love Clint Eastwood movies, you know, fucking Pale Rider and uh, High Plains Drifter, Outlaw Josie Wales, fucking just classics. But he unrealistically beats the fucks out of dudes. You know, he'll beat you know, three dudes that are much bigger than him. You see him, man, that dude weighs like a fucking 145 pounds. He's skinny, super, super skinny. But it kind of, in High Plays Drifter, that was kind of an effective look because he just looked like some kind of, kind of tumbleweed fucking range bum that just kind of appears out of nowhere. You know, he, he looks ghostly. Because he is. He's supposed to be a ghost. Yeah. So, so I'll allow it because so, he's yeah. actually technically not supposed to be a human. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's a revenant. Yeah. And now, he's good as long as he's slinging guns. But when you got him out there fucking punching people and knocking them out and all this kind of stuff, it doesn't play well today when you see it because there's definite size difference between him and other people. I mean, his arms are like the size of a broomstick. You know, he just he had no no muscle on him. He's built like a model. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Mango says, if I recall right, I was about to bring this up, Mango. Uh, Clint's first movie was Revenge of the Creature. Yes, it was. Yeah. He yeah, actually he had. Yeah, I've seen it a million he was times because it was on MST. Did he play well, he was like a scientist tradition? assistant. Assistant, yeah. He tradition. was in like one scene where like he had something in his pocket or like a chimpanzee like take something out of his pocket or yeah. some shit like that. Uh, the star of that movie, I, if I remember correctly, was wasn't John Agar in that shit? Yeah. I wonder if John Agar was difficult to work with because he always comes across as such a condescending douche like in every single movie or every role that I've ever seen him in because he's in a lot of movies that were on MST, so I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of his stuff he was in that one um what was that one where they fell down to the in the center of the earth and uh, the mole people the mole people yeah so he was in that and it's just like he just fucking mansplained the whole movie through and i'm just like oh my god would somebody just please punch him in the taint mm -hmm. i couldn't take it and so but I, so i wondered if he was like that in real life but yeah so john agar was in revenge of the creature and uh clint eastwood was like in a scene with him i went out of my way to buy a clint eastwood movie that 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 i saw 
uh, on uh, it was, I think I think I didn't get that one off of Amazon. I got that one off of fucking what's the other one? eBay. I hadn't seen it since I was a kid. It's oh man, I want to see this one. I wonder if it's as good as I remember. The Firefox. Remember Firefox? Yeah, I remember that. I saw I saw that on cable back in the eighties. I I put it in and I I couldn't get halfway through it. (laughs) You're like, wow, this sucks. I remember this being a great movie. This shit was boring. You know what I mean? But see, that's what I mean. I kind of feel like sometimes. You know, particularly people that maybe didn't live through the 80s and yeah. are kind of, like, romanticizing the 80s. Yeah. Like, oh, all the movies are bad. So, like, there are awesome movies from the 80s. I'm not saying that. But there were a lot of shitty movies in the 80s, too. Yeah. And then sometimes you saw movies back in the 80s when you were a kid and you were like, that was so fucking rad. And yeah, then you yeah. see it now and you're like, ugh. And like, it's yeah. like, it's super cringe. Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? It was real low budget. It didn't look that good on screen. Look, it was shot with a cheap video camera. It might have been because I was watching it on an HD television and it just... It upscaled too much, you know what I mean? It, the motion looked weird, but it just, and the acting and everything, it was just off. And not much happens in it. He just steals it, a jet and then He what? steals a jet, but they're trying. They, I don't lot. remember a single thing. It that seemed happened, exciting it. when you were a kid back in the day. He's going to go to Russia to steal a jet. Russia, it's on the other <gasps> side of the damn planet. Yeah, they got those nuclear missiles and shit. That was back That's during where the, all the Col- commies lived. Yeah, that was during the Cold War. So the Russia, yeah. Russia seemed a lot more mysterious back then. So especially when you were a kid. So oh, he's going to Russia, and he's stealing the jet. And then you see the jet. I remember the jet being looking badass. You see it now, it just like a jet. It's a Delta Wing jet, kind of like the fucking Valkyrie. You know, we never really it looked like kind of. And an SR seventy one had a baby. Look, you know, look kind of like that. But when you were a kid, you were just like, look at that fucking jet, you know. But you see it now, you're like, well, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's a plane. <laughs> it's, it's a plane. So what? Yeah. Mango says, I saw Firefox at the cinema back in the day. Yeah, so did and I. And said it would be good for a remake. Yeah. It probably did. I kind of wish, like I said, I kind of yeah, wish. Tom Cruise do it. <laughs> uh, don't, don't say that too loud. Somebody might hear that. But um, <laughs> that's that's all we need. But that, well, that's the thing. I kind of feel like more people, I wish that they would take like movies that weren't all that great and take another swing at them. You know what I mean? Rather than, like, taking a movie that was fine the first time around. And then, like I said, I can't, it's, you know, I'm not in charge of who gets to remake movies or whatever. But I do kind of feel like, you know, yeah, the good shit gets remade. And I'm just like, why did they even bother? Why don't you take a movie that was kind of sucky but was, like, a good idea and remake that and, like, try and get it right this time? Yeah. Because there's plenty of those. You'd never run out. Yeah. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Uh, Mango said, thing is, he had to control the jet with his mind, but yeah. think in Russian. Just the weapon that's system. That's right. I forgot yeah, about yeah, that yeah. It aspect. Was, it was just the weapon system. Wow, that's stupid as hell. Yeah, it was just the weapon system. <laughs> yeah. I had forgotten about that you aspect could target the it with the, with the Yeah, it didn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. I guarantee you pilots have no problem using the targeting <laughs> system just with their thumb, Okay. <laughs> yeah it's like it seems like it's much harder to yeah, like try to yeah. control shit with your mind because yeah. then you have to like keep your mind from wandering out of yeah, did I get yeah. bread <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I gotta take the car and get the oil changed <laughs> oh shit <laughs> you know what I mean it's then gonna it, be like that then after that fucking I think it was what was it was, it was like a helicopter version it was Airwolf no not Airwolf it was Airwolf I think was Blue Thunder that's what it was Blue Thunder didn't it have fucking what's the name Shriver was in it um the dude that was in Jaws, wasn't it, was his name Shriver? No. Sh- uh, Scheider. Scheider. Roy, Roy, Roy Scheider was in it. I think it was called Blue Thunder. I remember that one, too. Yeah, it was some cops with a special fucking helicopter. That, it kind of reminded me of Firefox at the time. Because I think Firefox had come out a couple years before. And then that thing comes out. and That, that, that movie was fucking sucked, too, but we loved it. <laughs> Blue Not Thunder happens, also Blue, Blue Thunder Th- also an awesome song by the band Galaxy Five Hundred. I think it was called Blue Thunder. I may be wrong. Subjective Perspective Collective says, uh, I have a love hate relationship with Tom Cruise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We do too. Well, Tom is more on the love side and I'm more yeah, on the hate Cruise. side. Yeah. I do like some of his movies, yeah. I'm not saying that. But every time I see him I just kinda wanna punch him. You know what I mean? Still. There's propaganda. <laughs> all this damn black propaganda. It's not propaganda. Against Tom. All right? No, it's not. It's just my own eyeballs, like, looking at him going, man, that guy seems like a real douche. <laughs> this shit all began when he jumped up on Oprah's couch. That's when, it didn't. That's when I didn't like him before that. I didn't but, I didn't like him going back to the 80s ever since I saw Risky Business. I was, I was like, wow, that guy is was, really a tool. I was watching that shit when it happened, him jumping up on a couch. And... Yeah, it, it was dumb as fuck. You know, I would I would have done it. 
but you're dealing with Tom Cruise and he was doing that in front of an audience filled with adoring females. And he's playing to the crowd that's right in front of him. And those girls were eating that shit up in the studio. It just didn't play well outside the studio Well, on the television. thing about it, I don't think people that hated him hated him because of that. I mean, yeah. like I said, I hated him way before that. And, I didn't even see yeah. that when it happened. I just and, saw it later. And then he goes on about he didn't believe in um, the uh, psychiatry and them medicating people and stuff. Which, there, there, is, some, there, there, there is some to what he's talking about. Uh, psychiatry... And just the medical practice in general has a real bad history of making a lot of mistakes. The thing is, though, is that he's saying Scientology should replace that shit. Right. And I can't go with that. You know, no. Uh, not no, Scientology. Let's, let's not go with no. that. We did, Hubbard, we've done several shows yeah. about how shitty Scientology yeah. is. Ron Hubbard has no idea how the human mind And I have works. some personal experience. I wasn't in Scientology, but I have some personal yeah, no. experience with no. working at a company that was no. run by Scientologists, if you're new here. so Right. You know, yeah, I've told that story a bunch of times. And uh, no thanks. I don't want anything to do with that. I got no problem with attacking pseudoscience. The problem is Scientology is a pseudoscience. So you don't want to... Among like, other things. Yeah, it's it, also a it's cult. A, it's a cult. <laughs> and, it, and, and it's a fucking racket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so lots of things. Yeah. It's There's nothing good about it. Please don't join Scientology. Uh, Victor says, Tom Cruise is one of my favorite Hollywood power bottoms. Right. Well, there's no evidence of that. There's no proof of him being a power Allegedly. Bottom. Allegedly. Allegedly. He's Where the whole bottom. thing came from, let's be honest. He was in that movie where, what was it? It wasn't Ferris Bueller's Day Off, was it? No, he wasn't. What, what, was, what was that movie? What, Risky Business? Risky Business. That's where, that's where the gay shit started. I thought he the gay slides shit across with the Tom floor. Gun, with Top Gun. He slides across the floor in his fucking socks and his underwear, fucking lip syncing. Sing it, old time rock and roll. Old time rock and roll dancing. The director wanted him to do that. He did it. Fucking all these fucking gay men of America and fucking just he became the gay heartthrob. And because all these gay men liked him, he was what? He's a teenager when he did that, I think, right? Well, he I was think. real young. Yeah, that was I, one of his uh, that was yeah. maybe his first big role, yeah. I feel like. Yeah. So, you know, the gay dudes all fell in love with him. So then it, 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 it tainted him. You know what I mean? All the straight guys are like, oh, he's you gay. You said taint. Yeah, it tainted his taint. <laughs> that's what happens when they pegged him. Fucking t- no, I'm just kidding. That's all. That's Allegedly. All, that's all. That's <laughs> and, Please um, don't sue me. <laughs> no. Yeah, we, we, there's no. There's no evidence of fucking casting couch shit or anything like that, you know. But um, that's what happened. He became a gay icon, so people assume that he was gay. That's not what happened, though. I don't believe. And yeah, you don't have to be him. gay to be a gay icon. Yeah, you don't have to be gay to be gay. A gay icon. There's a lot of straight people that are gay icons. Yeah, and vice yeah. versa. I guess. The. Uh, but uh, if you you hear any Scientology insiders, they would tell you, "Fucking, there's no way Tom Cruise is gay. So he's not gay. He's straight." I'm. I'm. Yeah. I, I have no dog in that fight. Yeah, he's not. He, he, he's. Straight. I'm not. I'm not interested in. Having sex with Tom Cruise at any point. These ever. are supposedly people that have so audited. It doesn't matter to me. These, these are the people slides. that have seen his auditing material. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So all of the blackmail material. Yeah. They all the, they know I was blackmail because he, he's been. Um, they they audited his ass on the fucking e meter, uh, uh, fucking so he could fucking get rid of all of his body thetans and shit. And being gay wasn't in there. No. That's the way I remember the story. Like I said, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah, like Marty Rathburn, M- Marty Rathburn from the church said, "No, he's not gay." No. Mango is talking about uh, Blue Thunder with Roy Scheider, uh, yeah. far better than Firefox. Yeah, I'm, have it on Blu-ray and it's aged very well. It has. Or I hadn't seen it in a long time. I remember. I remember it being pretty good. But I like I said, it. I think I was like a teenager. I remember time. liking it, but I just assumed it probably wasn't any good because Firefox wasn't any good. And I remember, I thought of it kind of like as a cop ripoff of Firefox, but it probably wasn't. Look, I just. I don't remember that much about it. I remember they called it fucking dude Jaffo, just another fuck, fucking observer. And then uh, they were tracking down somebody. They found some one of the cop friends was fucking parked outside his girlfriend's house. They could tell he hadn't been there long because the fucking motorcycle engine was still hot. There was, it was just cool shit. I think it was a motorcycle engine. But they just had this damn super helicopter. It was, I don't remember what it was. I think it was just a French gazelle dressed up. I don't think... It looked kind of like a looked kind of like an H sixty four Apache at the time, but it's been a long time since I've seen that helicopter. Probably a gazelle. Mango Badger said, "Yep, it's tough being a gay icon. They love the Badger. Breaks my heart to tell them I'm a lesbian." No, oh, okay, yeah. 
<laughs> Shit happens, man. I love it. Uh, subjective Perspective Collective, which I'm just going to start calling you SPC from now on. I remember a shit ton of satanic psychedelic price films from the VHS 80s. I mean, I guess, like, he was still doing... I feel like his... He stopped doing movies. He didn't stop doing movies, but he went way back on the movies, like, after the 70s, I feel like. Like, yeah, he was still in some stuff in the 80s, and he was obviously in Edward Scissorhands. That was, like, his last role. But that was, like, only a few years before he died because he was, like, really, really old. He was actually supposed to have, like, a larger role in that, but he couldn't because his health was so bad. That's one thing that um, I was watching this documentary about him. And he was um, lifelong friends with a uh, very famous actress, Jane Russell. Like, they met on a movie set, and they were, like, buddies for their entire lives. And she went to visit him when he was sick and, like, dying and stuff like that. And she's like, that's the only time she ever saw him, like, really crabby. Because he was just, like, she said he was so frustrated because he loved life so much that he was mad that his body had betrayed him. You know what I mean? And he couldn't, like, get up and do stuff anymore like he used to. So he just, like, he was just, like, yelling at, like, yelling about, like, don't ever get old. Like, I wouldn't advise it. It's like, don't let anybody tell you it doesn't suck. It's, like, really, really bad. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's like, that's what... I mean, he had... Um, I mean, he smoked for a long time, so he had uh, COPD. And I think he ended up dying of uh, lung cancer, if I'm not mistaken. But, I mean, he lived until he was in eight, his 80s. He was, like... I think he was 82 when he died. He died in 1993, and he was born in 1911. So, yeah, 82. So, I mean, he lived a long time, but he was in very poor health from starting in the, like the 80s, you know what I mean? Which is why he didn't do a lot of movies like in the 80s, you know what I mean? Um, okay, so we, can we talk about Vincent Price now instead, of, fuck, about instead of fucking Tom Cruise again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess we always talk about that motherfucker. Yeah, it's we like talk. We, we talk about him almost as much as we talk about fucking Steven Seagal and yeah. I don't even want to get started <laughs> on that because then we'll just start picking on his fat ass and we'll just like, no. Nah. <laughs> we won't get anything no. done. Tom, if you're out there, man, I respect you, bro. That's, that's good. That's good. If you're Tom watching, loves if you're, you. If Tom's watching, Tom It's Tom loves. Love, Tom I, love. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're both in the short man mafia. I got your back. <laughs> and I saw that damn Top Gun flick that you did. It was good. Yeah. It was all right. It was good for a Star Wars remake. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, that's pretty much what it was, right? Yeah. It was, a, it was a remake of the. I don't like. It was an it okay. It was a better, re, better. It was an okay movie, but I yeah. don't really see why everyone was jizzing themselves over it. Was it was better than the Last Jedi. But Watch it was. Just, I mean, it was just kind of, like kind of there. Yeah. You know. What it I mean? was a standard movie. Yeah. It was like a standard old fashioned movie. Yeah. It was good. I could have done without the bar scenes, but it was all right. Mango said we need a Cruise and Seagal movie, mm -hmm. right? They need to like that would be super funny. Oh, you know what they should do? They should Tom do like Cruise would never allow it. They should do like a weird sci-fi thing yeah. where Cruz and Seagal swap bodies. <laughs> I'd watch that. <laughs> would they would never allow it. Scientology would never allow Tom Cruise to be in the same movie that dude. I know it's it's yeah. a shame because yeah. that would actually might be something that yeah. I would consider watching. <laughs> They're trying to get Steven Seagal to be on fucking Expendables Four. I want to see that. <laughs> He's gonna have a stunt double. He like to waddles sit down. into the room. Yeah, Steven Seagal is the only dude that has a stunt double. I knew to I should down. I, I knew I shouldn't have said Steven Seagal's name. Okay, now we're gonna be right, talking yeah. about like fucking Steven yeah. Seagal. <laughs> right. Can we like talk about? Go back. This? Go back to the. Go back Can to we this. please talk about Vincent Price now? Yeah, yeah, Jesus yeah, yeah, Christ. Yeah. yeah. Zach said I was just scrolling through the old school cool subreddit and found a pic of Vincent working on his paintings. Yeah, that's another thing that maybe I don't know if people that didn't grow up uh, in the heyday of Vincent Price. Uh, he was not only just an actor, he was also a very avid art collector uh, his whole entire life. And he actually, um, get into this in a little bit, but he um, actually opened or um, gave like a bunch of his uh, collection and a whole bunch of money to an art museum in East LA, which is still there, like at an East LA um, community college. Because he was real big on, and I want to talk about his whole Sears thing too, because he got gotten Sears, like selling art and everything. Because he was so into art, that was what he wanted to do to start with. That was what he went to college for. But um, that he thought that it should be accessible to everyone, and that was like really, really important to him. So that was another thing that he was really into was like art collecting. 
So here's one thing that I didn't really know. Now, Vincent Price actually came from money. Um, he came from like a, a pretty wealthy family. I don't think they were like robber baron wealthy, but they were pretty rich. I actually was watching a video earlier um, where it's this couple and they kind of like go around tours and stuff and they were in St. Louis and they were visiting like some sites having to do with like Vincent Price's past. So they actually showed um, the house where he'd grown up, like where his parents lived until they died in St. Louis, which is a beautiful fucking house. So it's like still there. It's like all kept up and everything. Um, I don't, I wouldn't go so far as to call it a mansion, but it was for sure enormous and it was brick and it was just this gorgeous, gorgeous house like on the street. I think it's Washington Street, Washington Avenue. I can't remember. But it's like this big, wide, beautiful boulevard with like all these really nice houses on it. So that's where his parents lived. And uh, oh, and they also went to downtown St. Louis where actually downtown St. Louis, because a bunch of famous people have come from St. Louis, like Chuck Berry and stuff like that. So they have um, in downtown St. Louis, they have like their own little Hollywood walk of fame. They have like little stars on the you know, in, embedded in the sidewalk. And Vincent Price has one. And it's, like, right in front of the art gallery there, which I thought was kind of nice. They also have a statue of Chuck Berry, like, right there in the downtown, which I also thought was pretty cool. But, yeah, so his family came from money. How his family got the money is kind of... It's, it's not funny, but, I mean, it's quirky. <laughs> it's unusual. So his grandfather, whose name was also Vincent Price... Um, and his dad's name was also Vincent Price. So I guess he's kind of like, well, it's weird because they call him a junior. I guess because his grandfather had a different middle name. Because normally he'd be the third. But yeah, because his grandfather was Vincent Clarence Price. And then he was Vincent Leonard Price. And then his dad was also Vincent Leonard Price. So he was a junior. But his grandfather actually invented this, the first, <laughs> this is so random. The first, uh, like, T cream of tartar based baking powder that was like the first one on the market and it was called dr price's baking powder and it was apparently like a huge huge success and he made like all the money so that's where the price family got all their money from was from this first cream of tartar based baking powder like they have even had little old timey like cans and shit like that which i thought was hilarious so that's where the family money came from however his dad whose name was also Vincent Price, um, owned a candy company, like National Candy Company. And the video that I watched earlier where they were in St. Louis, the building is actually still there. They said it's a U-Haul now, but it's like this really, really big, like cool building. But they said, actually, if you, it was called the National Candy Company and they still have like one of the original signs like over the door that looks like this little collage thing, like made of candy, which is really cool. But yeah, so his dad owned a candy factory. So it was like, Ooh, it's like Willy Wonka kind of shit. But yeah, so he came from like definite like, upper middle class upper class circles for sure so um he was also a descendant of the first white child born in the new world peregrine white who was born on the mayflower uh, original was, colonizer the uh, original colonizer <laughs> yeah like his through his i believe his mom's side of the family he was related to to that baby so he basically so he went to yale like when he got older and he got a degree, uh, I believe a bachelor's degree in English, but he also had a minor in art history. And then he actually went on a taught for a year. So he was a teacher and um, he said that he taught for a year and then he realized, he said he came to the startling realization that he didn't know anything. I'm like, yeah, I know that feeling. But um, yeah, so he's like, I don't really want to teach anymore. Really, he wanted to, um, he wanted to do art. He wanted to be an art historian, generally. So he went to London, and he was going to get his master's in fine arts. But while he was in London, he actually got sucked into theater, and he decided that he was really, really into that and that he would rather do that. So he actually started performing professionally in the mid-1930s. I think his first stage performance was 1934, and he also joined, um, you know, Orson Welles had the Mercury Theater. Um, he also was a member of that. So he got, like, in... So, like I said, you, you were saying before when I said that he came from a real wealthy family who were very, um, you know, like I said, they weren't robber baron rich, but they were, like, 
rich enough that they were kind of like big wigs in the community and all that other kind of stuff. That really help you in Hollywood. And that really does help you. Well, I mean, you have the money to... You have the money to say no. Ha well, and you have the yeah. money to like have choices. Like yeah. I said, he, you know, I could never have afforded to go to London to study or anything yeah. like that because, you know, I didn't have any money when I was younger and my mm -hmm. parents didn't have any money. But, you know, the fact that he could do that, he went to Yale and he did all this other kind of stuff. So, yeah, that always does kind of help getting a. Yeah, when you show up. up to Hollywood, you know, looking for a job and you can act, you know, they hire you some fucked, they, they offer you some fucked up roles. Like, no, nah, I ain't taking that. Which that already improves your career. Yeah. You can say no. I said, who are you? Oh, I'm Vincent Price, man. I studied at I'm Yale. I'm Vincent fucking Price. That's I'm it. I'm at Yale. I got money. I don't need to get money to, 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 to act. <laughs> act that's, that's, for, that's, for, that's for poor people. I'm just doing this. That's for poor people. Yeah, I'm just doing this for fun. <laughs> oh, okay, you're hired. Yeah, what, yeah you're, you're hired. Yeah, what, what role do you want? You know, that's, 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 that's exactly what could happen. Because <laughs> you're negotiating from strength. Yeah. You're not showing up, hey, man, I'll take anything you give me. You know, well, see, I, I think, got rent to pay. I know. think that's kind of the shittiest yeah. thing about yeah. being poor. Yeah, <laughs> is you just kind of get you kind of get like forced into situations that if you had money, you, you wouldn't, wouldn't have to get into. Have to get into that. You're right. You know what I mean? Yeah. The first first offer you get is some piece of shit movie that ruins your career, but you had to take it. But you, you had, had to, to take it because you, you had, had to, to like you got to eat. Yeah. You know what I mean? The yeah. thing about Vincent Price though, and I'm not really sure how much his background like. Um, maybe uh, played into this or, you know, obviously it, it was probably just his talent as well. I'm sure it was a combination of those two things. But he seemed like he was almost, I don't even, I don't know if I'd call him like an overnight sensation, but for sure he didn't really seem to go through. Because you know how like a lot of actors sometimes will be like, man, I worked for like 10 fucking years and these shitty, ad, like I did commercials and all this other kind of shit and like nobody noticed me. And then finally they got this big breakout role and then they got famous and everything like that. Vincent Price didn't really seem to go through that. Um, he basically, like I said, he went to London to study fine arts. Then he decided he was more into the theater, so he was going to do that. He got right in with the Orson Welles thing. And he basically got, I think, his first um, uh, stage show that he did that he got like real big notices for was uh, Chicago. Like He did some of that. And then he was in um, this... Uh, play called Victoria Regina which is about you know Queen Victoria and everything and he played uh, Prince Albert in that and that was and all. Huh? with the piercing and all probably yeah I don't know um, but yeah so he was in that and he like immediately started getting really good notices and when that play was really successful and it came to the United States he came with it like Helen Hayes was in it as well she played Victoria who was like she was like a huge star at the time so I'm sure that kind of helped. He joked that he's like, yeah, when the play came to the United States, I came over with the sets because he had been like on stage in London, but he came over. So when he came over and they did the play over here, like immediately he was like a smashing success. Everybody's like, oh my God, this guy's amazing. So, I mean, Hollywood pretty much immediately like started calling. Like I said, he didn't really have any period where he was struggling or anything like that. It just seemed like he was immediately famous you know what i mean like not famous famous but you know just getting kind of like famous on the stage you know so yeah so after this uh after he toured with this um play victoria regina for i think he toured with it for a year and it was so successful that you know you know they called him up to start being in movies now as i said even though he's known for horror roles nowadays, he actually started out more in a lot more diverse roles. Although he did tend to, they usually had him play historical figures, which I thought was kind of interesting, but he was like in a lot of noir and stuff like that. Like his first film role was actually in 1938 and it was a movie called Service Deluxe, which was actually a comedy. Um, so he was in that as well, but um, you know, he played like uh, Brigham Young, you know, the guy yeah, that uh, started. Once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He played that. He played, um, he was in Song of Bernadette. So he he's in like a lot of kind of period pieces. I guess because he came across as very, even though he was a Midwestern guy, he came across as very, like I said, urbane and very elegant and almost like European, even though he wasn't European. Well, he spoke in transatlantic, if you noticed. But mm -hmm. he, he does have... He does have his own personal accent, though. There's no way to describe it. It's modified transatlantic. Yeah. And uh, he sounds good. Yeah. I can, I can see why some Americans thought he was European. 
I can too. Yeah. He definitely comes across like that. Yeah. I think he's kind of emulating British actors, actually. Some of their Probably so. Yeah. I mean, he seems to, because we talk about this a lot too, like how British actors tend to, and this is just a generalization, but they do tend to take the the art of acting like much more seriously, maybe. Well, they got all that Shakespearean theater. You know, right, right, right. goes back fucking a long time. They take the shit seriously. Hollywood did. Hollywood started off kind of like in a situation kind of like the circus. You know, you could just get re- recruited off the street and if they liked you. If you were a good looking girl and you blew the right people, you could be a star. Yeah, they, they didn't take it that seriously. Yeah, and I kind of feel like, I mean, people nowadays yeah. piss and moan about, like, yeah. Hollywood this and that, but it's like, it's always it's been always like been that. Yeah. It's always been like that. In, yeah. in the sense that, you know, yeah, there have been actual, like, creative, artistic people working and making, like, masterpieces, but most of the time it's just, like, them knocking off, like, some cheap jack, like, fucking movies just to make a buck, like, yeah. off the Saturday matinee, you know what I mean? Yeah, and even, even the silver screen in the golden era of Hollywood... No, it was bad back then, too. <clears throat> Hollywood ran the town. They ran the cops. A, Hollywood, a, a, big, a person big in Hollywood could literally kill someone and get away with it. The cops would cover it up. They, you know, it did happen. It yeah. happened a lot. And then the um, funny thing is is that in California, back in the Gold Rush era and even you know the early California Republic, you had a lot of brothels. All right? And brothels and saloons. You had girls working in there that came from out east. Well, those girls were in there, and they were the only girls in town a lot of time. They didn't really want to be prostitutes. They got hooked up in these damn contracts. It was basically slavery, you know, indentured servitude. A woman doesn't want to really be a hooker in that, in, for a living, you know what I mean, in, in, a, in a brothel. So they would learn to play instruments and sing, and they would put on little stage shows. And they would put their name outside in front in a star. That's where the, that's where the, the idea of a person, of a girl being a star came from that. So a hooker and a star was synonymous back in the 1800s. And that carried on into Hollywood. When a girl was a star, she was a hooker too. A lot of those famous actresses, they maybe they weren't prostitutes when they started out, but when they got in there... You had to, it wasn't just casting couch shit. They were sleeping with producers, and that's where the money came from to get the movie in the first place. It was fucking, it was the skin trade. Early 1900s, if you if you were a, an actress, a Hollywood actress, that was tantamount to being a hooker. And, you know, I don't think modern people realize that. But they, uh, at least in California culture of the old time, uh, an actress was a hooker, a star was a hooker. They were just kind of high class about it. So yeah, so like I said, um, mostly noir kind of films in the 30s, uh, you know, and some comedies and some dramas, period dramas, that kind of stuff. He plays, like I said, a lot of historical figures. Now, the first horror movie that he did was in 1939, and it was Tower of London. That also had Boris Karloff in it. And then in 1940, he was actually in the sequel to The Invisible Man, um, The Invisible Man Returns. I think they couldn't get, um, who was in The Invisible Man? Claude Rains. It was Claude Rains, wasn't it? Uh, Um, I think that he couldn't come back for the, um, for the sequel for whatever reason. And so, um, Vincent Price, like, took over the role of The Invisible Man in 1940 in the sequel. So he's in that too. So he actually did start out, like, you know, doing a few horror movies as well and Zach mentioned earlier like a couple of other movies like Dragon Wick and Leave Her to Heaven with uh, Gene Tierney uh, who was also in Laura and those were also in the 1940s and then he started getting more into like noir and like playing villains and I feel like he got to a point where he sort of at least according to his daughter like I was watching an interview with her but she said there it came a point where he like was playing these villains and he's like this is like my this is my wheelhouse. You know what I mean? He seemed to really enjoy playing villains and he was really, really good at it. Yeah. So I kind of feel like that after that point, I kind of feel like he, I don't think he really started to get typecast typecast until maybe house of wax 
like after that because that was such a big huge hit that they weren't expecting and he plays like such a demented character in that i love house of wax by the way i don't think we've ever done the 1953 original have we now when you start getting into the demented fucking vincent price horror movies i really wouldn't call that acting i would call it performing he's a performer he's great but it's none of it's believable it's not supposed to be that's not the tone of it just he's just having a good time having a good time over the top and he wants you to have a good time yeah yeah, that's what's cool about him, and, and he's kind of putting his own fucking trade. He's putting his own signature on every role. He's kind of playing the same guy in a way, but you know, it's okay. That's that he had a fan base, and people came to see him, and then he knew what he was doing. Mister Eighty Eight said, uh, "England produces thespians, and the United States produced movie stars." Yeah, it'd be a good way to put the 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 British when it came to acting in English. They had that shit fucking nailed going all the way back to fucking Shakespearean days. It was Shakespeare. He, uh, that's where English or in- English theater came from. America was kind of aping it with movies, but it was just more mass production. It wasn't as... There was no television, so you had to do it through movies. They, were just, they would make a lot of them. You know? It was just... A lot of it was just kind of slipshod. You had some good movies, though. It's just that most of them weren't. And uh, you, they were very forgettable. And they were kind of like built on a formula, a lot of them. But uh, even today, if you come across a good series, seems like it's an American series in English, and and even movies, the best actors and actresses in there are going to be British. You won't notice it. They'll even have American accents and everything, you know. Like in The Walking Dead, I couldn't believe that old dude was fucking... Not from Georgia. That sounded like a Georgia yeah, Andy, accent. Andy Lincoln. Yeah. I, I was like, yeah, that's a real Southerner there. No, he's British. Yeah. I saw that dude talking in his own voice. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> he fooled me, man. Isn't that always freaky? He like when you see me, that, man. like if you yeah. don't realize he's a British, yeah. and then like you see an interview and you're like, why yeah. are you talking like that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So and the, and um, the dude that played uh, Here's Not Here, fucking, what was that guy? Uh, uh, the black dude from, yeah. from that. I was for sure that Lenny was, James, that guy's name. What's is. his name? Well, I knew he was British because I'd seen him. I in didn't lots know that guy was British prior. Yeah. I thought he was a southern guy, man. Nah. I thought he was a southern black guy, man. That dude fucking nailed it. Like I said, so, I'd, I'd seen him in some other things. Yeah. Well, I should have, you know, Andrew Lincoln prior to Walking yeah. Dead was in Love Actually, but yeah. because I'm not a rom com girl. Uh, I actually had not seen that. Yeah. So I didn't realize that he was yeah. British either until later. Now when you <laughs> flip it around the other way. When you have an Americans doing British accents, you're gonna end up with like fucking. It Keanu doesn't always. Reeves. It doesn't always end up so well. <laughs> Keanu Reeves. Oh, uh, we Keanu don't. Reeves. We, we're sorry. We don't oh, want to pick on you, Keanu, because I love Dracula. Keanu Reeves. But yeah. oh yeah, his his new. Shit. But his British accent in uh, in uh, Dracula was just terrible. So so bad. Um, Winona Ryder's wasn't that great either. No, but, I mean no. <laughs> no. Well, they just learned it in a couple of days, you know. Yeah, they, although I've heard British people do in, in cheap British movies. I got in some hammer. Not, I don't think it was a hammer movie. It's what that other horror co- uh, uh, company that they had from back in the '60s, and they had a character who was supposed to be an American. And it was all fucked up. I don't yeah. know what. So not every British person could do an, uh, an American accent, but but it's usually more successful than the other way yeah, around, and yeah, I'm not yeah. really sure why that is. Yeah. Because I, <laughs> I was all like, every British person I've ever met, um, they were just like, oh, I can't talk. I can't do that. Like, yeah. they can't do an American accent. I said, I could probably do a British accent, but I'm not going to do it because I just embarrassed myself. Oh. Victor says, 90s Keanu Reeves made me gay. Lots of things yeah. made you gay, Victor. Yeah. <laughs> 90s Keanu Reeves. Man, I got to go back. I got to go back. Keanu now. Reeves also seems like a really nice person. So I always oh, yeah, like, he's cool. I always kind of like hate to shit on him because of his accent and. Dracula. No, but. he geeks out on motorcycles and guns. It was, it was and that's really bad. Keanu Reeves, Reeves can shoot. I've seen him at the range. He's he is good. What's that fucking uh, series that he does now? Uh, John Wick. John Wick. I've seen one, two, and three. I have one and two. Saw three in the theater. We haven't seen four yet. We're gonna have to rent that. I saw that it just came out on streaming, but yeah, it's probably like twenty. Probably, it's 20, probably twenty bucks, bucks to yeah. buy it. I imagine. We'll, I think we'll you can it. only buy it. I don't think you can rent it yet. I buy it on Blu-ray, and I need three too. And those are fucking fantastic movies. Uh, Keanu can, can he can entertain, bro, and he can shoot, and that's the kind of movie he needs to be in. It's just kind of a fantasy gangster shoot him up mo- movie. Just good, really good, entertaining. I want to revisit them all because they were visually stunning. 
Remember how good one and two were and three? They just look great. Manga said John Wick 4 is amazing. That's what they say. They say it's just Yeah, I've heard that. Great. Yeah, yeah, I've heard it sounds good. I want to see it. I want to see it, too. Like I said, I just yeah. noticed it came up on Amazon Prime, like, to buy. But I'm sure it's, like, probably $20. Mr. 88 says, Chicken or the Egg, do we associate Vincent Price's voice with horror because he was in so many horror movies? Or was he in so many horror movies because of his voice? You know, I don't really know. No, it's because he was in so many horror movies. I mean, well, the thing about it, I mean, all of the movies that he did, and he did hundred, hundreds, it was, like, at least, I don't, somebody said 200, I don't know, know if it was that many, but it was, like, for sure over 100. 211, yeah. It was, it was for sure over 100. Um, I heard somewhere that less than a third of those were horror movies. So, but those are the ones people ever, like, everybody remembers the most, obviously. Because, like I said, horror fans were nerds, you know what I mean? And I'm not, that's no shame, I'm one too. So I'm just saying that, if you make a really good classic horror movie, people are going to remember that bitch forever. You make a good classic drama, maybe people remember it. Maybe not. <laughs> 50 years from now, will people still be watching it? Maybe. Maybe not. Horror movie? Definitely. They'll definitely be watching that shit. They don't give a shit if it's 50 years old. They don't give a shit if it's 100 years old. Shit, I still watch silent movies. I watch shit that's more, that's more than a century old, and I still enjoy that. So you know what I mean? It's, and I and I don't know if other subgenres really have that. And that's pretty good, like, coming from a genre that's still... It's a lot better than it used to be, but it was still, like, um, kind of disrespected, I feel like. Because it feel like, you know, if you were in horror movies, people, like, kind of looked askance, like you were slumming or something. You know, yeah. if you were an actor, which I always thought was kind of shitty. Because I was like, why is that... Why do people shit on fucking horror and sci-fi? Well, They're just as I legit. I don't think they really do that anymore. Not was, anymore. It's not. Ge- it's not like it used to be. Those, those are older generations that are gone now. And I think a lot of it had to do with in the fifties, and even to a certain extent the sixties. Sci-fi and horror were kids' matinee movies. Yeah. The adults didn't go see them. That was like seeing He-Man or some shit like that. They didn't care about that. <laughs> the fuck? Phones ringing. Phones ringing. Yeah. So I think I think it had more to do with the fifties, but those people are all dead now. Yeah, they were old in the fifties. I mean, it definitely. I kind of feel like that was fading away, like in the eighties and nineties. Yeah. Television killed. Television killed the prejudice against horror. Yeah. Think about it. Because movies could no longer be daytime television for kids. You know what I mean? The movies right. had to, had had to get more upscale. And then all those horror movies ended up being played on television, where people actually saw some of them. Some of them were good. Like, Them was really good. You know? Uh, they, they, it is. If, yeah. You know, so, so some of the shit stuck. Yeah. And then they started making... The new generation of guys came out and started making better horror movies. You know? John Carpenter came and made The Thing. That fucking blew you out of fucking water, man. Thing still was, one of my favorite still horror movies of all time. Then Alien came yeah. out. Oh man! So you had good horror, and it was mixing with sci-fi, which those those were two forbidden genres back in the fifties. It was going to be bad. Yeah, that, that was like for kids, or it was yeah. like shitty cheap it was stuff. Shitty because I kind of feel like when people thought of like horror movies or sci-fi movies from the fifties, they thought of like big bug movies. Yeah. Now had some you, of those were good though, but you so shown, most of them were like really shitty. Had you shown like Alien and Alien Two to a nineteen fifties audience? It have scared the shit out of them. They would have liked it. I think they would have liked it. I always kind of wonder, like, if I... They didn't see that, though. If I invented a time machine, I would just... I would like to do that just out of curiosity. I know it would cause, like, time rifts and, like, you know, the butterfly effect and everything. But still, it's just like, yeah, what if you could take Alien and take it back to the 1930s? In the 30s, they would have they would have liked it probably. Yeah, even maybe more. later, maybe the 50s would be like a better time. If you yeah, took it back to the, the 50s, 50s the 30s, and like the, showed it to people, they would yeah. blow their fucking minds. Yeah. That would blow their fucking. People of the 20s and 30s were a lot more hardcore than they were of the 50s. In a weird way, when it came to movies, they were pre haze, so they'd they you could go back to the 30s and show fucking Alien One to them, and they'd go, "Oh yeah, yeah, that's awesome. They'd like that. <laughs> yeah. Space, outer space. Does it look like that?" In outer space, you know they because you know they weren't sure what outer space looked like in the 1930s. They still weren't in the 50s because yeah. I feel like they yeah. had a lot of those sci-fi clouds movies where it's like it's yeah they got clouds in space. They're walking around on the outside of the spaceship. Yeah, you open up the window on the, on, <laughs> open up the window on the spaceship. Hey, jump crack out. the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the spaceship because yeah, someone yeah. farted in there or something. Yeah, yeah. 
And then, you know what I mean? And then, like, everybody's, like, there's aliens on the moon and shit like that. Yeah. They didn't know shit. Mm. They didn't know shit in the 50s. Uh, but, yeah. So, yeah. So, he's in uh, a bunch of noir movies and stuff like that, like, during the 1940s, like, the late 1940s. Now, here's something that's interesting. They said that his first starring role, because prior to that, he'd been kind of like, you know, the second guy or, like, you know, character actor type of guy. He said that, that it says that his first starring role was in uh, a movie called The Baron of Arizona, which was like a biopic, and that came out in 1950. Interestingly, when I was on Amazon Prime last night, and I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that I watched the movie Shock, and I think that was from 1946, that says on Amazon Prime that that was Vincent Price's first starring role. So, because, I mean, if it did come out, I mean, he was, like, pretty much the star of that. So... I'm not really sure, like, what they're using as, like, starring role type of material. But I would have called that a starring role. And that was earlier. So, I'm just saying. Um, also, something else that he did from the late 1940s till the early 1950s was he was on uh, the radio show The Saint, playing Simon Templar. So, there was that as well. Now, his first kind of big breakout horror role, as I mentioned earlier, was in 1953 with House of Wax, which is a great fucking movie if you haven't seen it. House of Wax, I think, was only... Now, some sources say that it was the first 3D movie. It wasn't. There was actually one prior to it, but I think that that one came out, like, only, like, the same year as House of Wax. So it was, like, a very new thing, like this 3D uh, thing. Thank you, John Robert Robertson. Hey guys, I just found out that Vincent Price never played a vampire role ever, except in Monster Club, which wasn't really a serious role. Yeah, I feel like he joked around about it a couple times. Like, he never played Dracula or anything like that. He would have probably made a good It'd Dracula. Good, yeah. but, um, but he did, like, kind of fart around with the vampire thing. Like, I think, like, when he was on, um, like, variety shows and stuff, like, sometimes he would put on, like, the vampire getup. Yeah. And I think, didn't he have fangs on... Um, Muppet Show? Or no, Kermit had fangs. Didn't Kermit bite him on the neck? I thought Kermit, like, uh, opened his mouth and Kermit know. had fangs. And then Kermit bit Vincent Price. I don't know. I if I'm that. remembering correctly. I haven't seen it in a while. But yeah, he never did play uh, a vampire, did he? He usually play. He seemed to play, like, a lot of... Well, later on. He always played, like, Mad Men, kind of. Mad he, Men, he was good at that. Sorcerers. Yeah, that kind of shit. That kind of shit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, somebody mentioned, uh, the Mad Magician. Yeah, he was in that too. That was 1954, so talking of Mad Men. And he was also in The Fly and mm. Return of the Fly. He didn't I play, forgot about he, he didn't play, he didn't play the fly, the guy with the fly head. No. He, he, he played, wasn't he his brother or his brother-in-law? I don't remember. It's been a while since I've I seen I forgot that he fly. was in it, though. Yeah, he was in it. Yeah. Yeah, it was like a major role. Um... But I really like that movie. Actually, I was watching a documentary, and they showed the final scene. You know, obviously, everybody now knows the David Cronenberg one from eight, from the 80s, which is also an amazing film. Yeah. But the one from the 50s is, like, still pretty fucking cool. That last scene where Vincent Price, like, finds the fly body with the human head on it. Yeah. Stuck in the spider web. Yeah. Yeah going help me yeah, and then yeah. like the spider comes and like bites his head oh that's still yeah. like fuck i was like god that's horrible yeah like for 1953 yeah. like just the fucking thinking about it i don't know like you think about it now because it's just like oh it was, a, it was a dumb movie from the 50s but i'm just like think about the fucking implications of that that's awful yeah there's a human being flying around like a fly yeah, with his head, and he's yeah. and he's like looking, and he's you like, can see yeah. like his tiny little face, and this yeah, big yeah, fucking yeah. spider comes and like bites his head. Yeah. That'd have been a whole movie right there to be that Jesus dude. Jesus Christ! It'd be a whole movie right there to be the fly, the, like, the actual little man fly. I'm like, that's awful. And with the dude, yeah, that why played did anybody that man, ever make that? Now the dude, that, the <laughs> dude that that play, the dude that was playing the fly that was getting eaten by the spider, was it the same actor that played the the scientist fly? Was that him? In the I paper? think it was, yeah. Yeah, because it would have to be. Like I said, it has, it's been a so while. So he just tra he transferred over there. Yeah. That's some weird shit, huh? <laughs> Can you imagine being tiny and like having your fucking head bit off by a yeah. spider and like yeah. knowing that this? Oh my yeah. god, that's awful. That's like yeah. one of the worst things I could. And there was of. no way to save him. You couldn't get them both together and put them back in, in into, into the fucking machine and get them fucking sorted out because you lost that that one. You lost part of him. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Although it probably wouldn't work, would it? 
put them back in the machine together and tell. Well, that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to, weren't they? Okay. That's why they were trying to find, because obviously they had scientists who had a big, huge fly head. Yeah. And then you had a fly body with like a tiny little human head. Okay. And so they were trying to, like Vincent Price, like I said, he was either the guy's, I think he was his brother. He was either his brother or his brother-in-law. I can't remember. So he was like telling this little kid, he's like, um, cause the little kid is like, Hey, I saw that fly. Cause he's like looking for the, he's like, have you seen like a fly with like a weird white head? Yeah. <laughs> like somewhere in the garden. Cause they wanted to like put him back in the, like in the, in the matter transference machine yeah. it had to a see white if they could put, a white him back, arm. put him back again. Yeah. That's right. He had it an had arm too. Arm. Didn't he? Had a human arm. Didn't yeah. he? That was fucking. Yeah. But I was just like watching <laughs> that scene again. I was like, Jesus Christ, that's awful. Can yeah. you imagine like what that would be? I'm like, that's pretty fucking hardcore for like 1950s. Like I said, I know everybody talks about like the David Cronenberg one, which didn't have that going on. But I was like, I don't know. That that's also pretty awful. And then like Vincent Price has to like smush him with a rock like before yeah. the spider like digests him, and I'm just like, ugh, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> that's terrible. Well, they had to put him out of his misery. Right. That's what I mean. Yeah. It's just like, oh my god, that's like it's fucking horrifying. <laughs> The more I thought about it, like, the more horrified I got. So, uh, so yeah. So, that was, like, throughout the 1950s. And this, I feel like, is when Vincent Price started... Because House of Wax was, like, a massive... Even though it was, like, it wasn't really... It didn't cost that much to make. But it was, like, a huge, huge hit. And, um... After that, and then since he did The Fly and everything, and The Mad Magician, so everyone just started to associate him. Like, it was his breakout role, for sure. But then everybody just started, he's like, oh, he's the horror guy now. So, like I said, he did get typecast in a way, but, you know, which I think maybe bummed him out a little bit. Although, he didn't really seem to complain about it all that much. um, Because he did seem to be having a good time playing villains and stuff, but he did seem to become indelibly, like, associated with the horror genre from that point forward. I think it was probably House of Wax that kind of sealed that. Um, So, yeah. Then he started his association with William Castle. That's another dude we should do a show about. That dude's fascinating. William Castle, he was kind of like, he would make all those, like, low-budget films that had all those, like, gimmicks, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, two of them, I think we've covered both of these on the show. The Tingler, for sure. Because I remember doing that one not too long ago. And The Tingler, which is actually like a much better movie than it sounds. Because it sounds like like a sex toy. I'm not going to lie. But it's actually like about, if you haven't seen it, it's about like this weird, it's a centipede like bug thing. And it like gets in your spine and it feeds on fear, right? And like, and so William Castle, the gimmick for that movie when it came out was that some theaters, not all of them obviously, but some kind of special theaters would have little buzzers like um, attached to the back of some of the seats. So in the scenes in the movie where like the Tingler was, you know, invading or like getting somebody or it's like, if there was a scene in the movie where the Tingler gets loose in a movie theater, like in the movie. And so they would set off the buzzers on some of the seats so everybody would like scream and freak I mean, it's out. It's probably obvious like when you saw, it, saw the seat. How much of it? Yeah, I'm, I'd be curious yeah, to know because it's obvious. like... This was before I was born. Yeah, so. I remember watching that movie and their explanation of where the Tingler came from. I remember just, I don't remember exactly what it was. I just remember that it was so fucking hokey and so implausible. What was it? It was a, it, it wasn't an alien. It was something from another dimension. No, it wasn't from another dimension. What was it? I don't think. How did it get in you? It was invisible, wasn't it? No, you could see it. Okay. Now I can't remember. It's like we haven't we saw it not that long ago because we see, it, we um and it grew it. it would it would get in you somehow and it would grow and it would go all down your spine underneath the skin. Yeah. Right. Like it. Yeah. It. And like no I said, it, it, it fed on fear. Yeah, but where did it come from? They they gave. I can't remember. Like, they did. It, it didn't make any sense to me. It wasn't. It wasn't a scientific explanation. Well, none of those movies. Yeah. Were. I was just like, what? like I said, and I always and I pull this out like every single time we talk about like dumb pseudoscience like in fifties movies. Yeah. Um, what was the movie about? Was it the, uh, the Amazing Colossal Man or the sequel, which is uh, the Colossal shit? I can't I remember that. The, the Colossal shit. No, that's not what it's called. But it, um, it was. I can't remember what the sequel was called. I'll remember it in a minute. They were both on Mystery Science Theater anyway. But there was one like um, there was one line in there where he says just like like it's the most natural thing in the world. Like everybody knows this. Oh well, everyone knows like the heart is one single cell. I'm like. Yeah. No, no, it's made up. It's I'm like mid- pretty <laughs> sure they knew that even in the 50s. Yeah, they would make, they'd pull shit out of their ass. So They're like, yeah, the next star over is fucking ten thousand. I'm like, you think that like whoever wrote yeah, the yeah, screenplay would have been yeah. like, maybe I should call a doctor about that. Is, yeah. is that right? Yeah, 
No, that's they didn't not know right. anything. I mean, they just <laughs> pulled right. shit out of their ass. They're like, then this, <laughs> then this must come from another solar system. Shit, that's over five million miles away. <laughs> <laughs> that's far, you guys. Yeah, <laughs> five million miles away. Huh? Shit, that's right here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. relatively speaking. Yeah. But yeah, the the thing they didn't about know what a light year was. The thing about the heart yeah. being one cell always kind of yeah. got me because I was like, that yeah. seemed like something that was really, really easy to check. When it came to, to the tangler, I thought they said that it was a part, it was an organelle or an organ in your body that, under certain circumstances, would grow into that. Oh that's, wait, maybe it was. That's what I thought it was, and it didn't make any goddamn sense. No, it didn't. But like yeah. I said, it wasn't it wasn't the dumbest thing that I heard in the fifties yeah. movie. That's for sure. But yeah, so. Yeah, so he was in the Tingler. The Tingler, I think, I don't know if this is um, the case, but I remember being really blown away by them uh, being like a large plot point being around LSD in the Tingler. And I was like, is that the first movie where they did that? Where they like based kind of, because I don't remember one before that. I mean, well, I know LSD like wasn't really invented before that, but I think that was the first movie that made LSD like kind of a big plot point like Which they one? and they even the tingler, the tingler? Oh, right. where they even say like they even call it lsd and like right. it's kind of a thing it was probably cutting edge experimental that's what i'm saying so i so i thought that was kind of interesting too so i don't know if it was the first movie to mention it or use it as part of the plot but it was for sure one of the first a lot I of these so-called high fucking tech street drugs that they have today turn out a lot of that shit they had that shit in the 1800s they had ecstasy in the in the late 1800s i didn't know that well, I mean, you know, yeah. chemistry's chemistry. No shit's knowing. been yeah. around they for. Had, yeah. They had all what do they call shit. it? There's nothing new under the sun, is there? No. Like, there's always, like, a variation of some shit yeah. going way back. Doc Holliday just go down, and his dentist just carried around a whole jar of cocaine. <laughs> Here's my jar of cocaine. Yeah, my jar of cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> the fastest gun in the West. <laughs> and that's why. Yeah. Ah. Darian Rose says, absolutely love the old Vincent Price movies, even in high school. I do, too. I was like, I'll, I'll watch pretty much anything he's in. Anything. So, yeah. So, he's in The Tingler with William Castle. The other one, probably more famously, uh, that he did with William Castle was House on Haunted Hill. Which, man, I still love House on Haunted Hill. That might be my second or third favorite. I've seen that, like, a million times. Um, and that one, the the uh, the gimmick for that one was called Emerjo. I remember that. And during some, because you know, like at the climax, if you, I feel like everybody's probably seen House on Haunted Hill, but um, during the climax where like the skull, the skeleton like comes out of the acid bath or whatever, yeah, um, that. yeah, like they would have the theaters. They had like basically they just had like a plastic skeleton or something like that, like off in the wings, and it was on a string, so it would come out like at the at that critical moment in the in the movie, and it would just like come up, like over the audience, so everybody would be like, "Holy shit, a real skeleton!" You know what I mean? So that was, it, I love that they called it Emerjo. Like yeah. it was something other than like a skeleton on a string. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeffy Art. Thank you, Jeffy Art. <laughs> yeah, Camp Guy said our nearest star is four four years away if you're traveling at light speed. Yeah. <laughs> Over 24 trillion miles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, shit, man. In the 50s, they say, no, nah, it's five million miles. You don't know what yeah. you're talking about. <laughs> far, real far. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't really yeah. think they had a really good handle. Well, yeah. well, that's the thing. And that was always kind of what made me mad about that whole, like, heart being one cell thing. I'm like, bitch, they knew that that was not the case in the 50s. They knew that. They The people writing these scripts just pulled shit out of their ass like no one will ever know. Yeah, maybe they just thought, well, just like yeah. a bunch of snot-nosed little kids are going to be watching yeah, this. So who gives a crap? Well, like, why even bother? Yeah. I guess they didn't bother. Oh. Maybe not. Which is kind of, that's kind of sad. But yeah, so um, if you haven't seen House on Haunted Hill, it's it's great. Uh, I actually like the original because they kind of remade it. I feel like in the but didn't they remake it in the '90s or some shit? I don't know. Um, they remade a lot of movies from back then in the '90s, and I didn't love them. But I really, really like again, probably one of my favorite Vincent Price movies. He's just fucking. I don't know. Like he's just fucking great in this. You know what I mean? In in that movie, I just really like his uh, character. Even though, like Tom was saying, he kind. I don't want to say he like he kind of plays the same character every time because he doesn't. But he always has that perfect combination of like elegance and villainy. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he's kind of, like, charming and suave and everything like that, but also, like, kind of sinister. And it's like, he was he was just really good at, like, striking that balance, you know what I mean? And I, th and I think that House on Haunted Hill was one of my favorite roles where he, like, did that. 
Um, but yeah, so he ki- even though he was mostly in horror films at this point, he was still in some other shit too. Um, some people pointed out he was in the Ten Commandments. Um, it wasn't a huge, huge role, but yeah, he was uh, in that as well. And he was on, he was like doing a lot of um, TV. And then um, right around the 1960s, he started hanging with Roger Corman. Now, like I said, Roger Corman, that's, man, we should do a show about Roger Corman and William Castle. That would be, like, a really good show. Um, Roger Corman uh, gave a lot of people their start, and he would basically make a movie in a week, and then he's like, hey, we can use these sets again. Let's make a whole other movie. You know what I mean? And he never lost money on a single movie. That's what I heard anyway. But he decided that he was going to start making these adaptations of Edgar Allan Poe stories because, obviously, Poe stories are in the public domain. And a lot of people, um, you know, had read them and, like, they were very popular stories. So he's like, you know, we can make some kind of low-budget adaptations of these. And so Vincent Price, big fan of Edgar Allan Poe, which, who isn't really? I I kind of feel like everyone is. But, um, so they started doing all these adaptations, honestly, all of which are great. I kind of feel like, um, I don't know. I feel like most people probably think Pit and the Pendulum is maybe the best one. I think Mask of the Red Death is the best one, but they're all good. I mean, they're all good. Um, But he was in Pit and the Pendulum, Tales of Terror, which was like an anthology, um, Comedy of Terrors, The Raven, which was a co- which was also a comedy, Mask of the Red Death, like I said, and Tomb of Lygia. So they did all of those like in the 1960s, and I kind of feel like those are probably the most iconic roles that Vincent Price is known for mm-hmm. nowadays. Like if you don't, if you haven't seen any of his other movies, I feel like probably you've seen most of the most of the Corman Poe adaptations because those were legit good movies. And I'm not going to say that all of Roger Corman's movies were good because they weren't like a lot of them were kind of, were pretty shitty. Um, and a lot of them were, uh, padded big time. Like you see, you see something like, um, did he make like, uh, I think it was teenage caveman. I think like legit 20% of that movie is just like people walking around. Yeah. (laughs) Cars Cars driving. Right. Cars so you can tell that in. they were really trying to like get yeah. to movie like Cars just pull- go walk around out in the out in the mountains for the twenty minutes. Car pulls into the parking spot, and then later <laughs> on the car pulls out of the parking spot when they leave. Just anything to pad the movie out. They did that shit. Yeah. So a lot, I feel like a lot of Roger Corman's movies are like that. But man, mad respect to the dude. Um, he got he gave so many directors their starts, and he did make some actually really good movies. And the Poe ones are his best ones. I feel like. But, I mean, he made a lot of shitty stuff, too. But, like I said, he didn't lose money on anything. Because he definitely knew what he was doing. Well, didn't Roger Corman do uh, Galaxy of Terror? He did. That's fucking... It, I love Galaxy of yeah, Terror. That's can, a great movie. Yeah, fucking Galaxy of Terror was great. And uh, had Sig Haig. Sid Haig was in it. That's right. Fucking a girl from fucking Happy Days. Yeah, she was Aaron in, Moran. And Moran was in it. And, uh... And you get to see a woman get raped by a giant maggot. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so there's that. It's more like a fucking caterpillar. Well, but same, same uh, if. <laughs> Yeah. Like and what was funny is that... I mean, it was in case you ever wanted to see that. It was an alien ripoff. Yeah. And uh, from that ripoff, who made that, the special effects, was Cameron. And James Cameron, yeah. James Cameron. And from that ripoff, that's how he got the job for... Aliens or Alien Two, yeah, because of Galaxy of Terror. See, like I said, Roger yeah. Corman. Roger, Corman, yeah, Galaxy even, of Terror looks good. Yeah, looks real good. Even yeah. though people kind of shit on him, just like, oh, he'd make yeah. movies for like five bucks or yeah. something like that, and make like you know three movies in on one yeah. set, which he did. Yeah, uh, he was, you know, he's yeah. thrifty. And the fucking funny thing about Galaxy of Terror is that it's got like a fucking little story that's sandwiched in it, an intro and an outro, and it's got. The, the main villain and it's Martin the Martian who's that guy's name that actor that played fucking the Martian from Mar- the, uh, my my favorite Martian oh right 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 um uh, oh shit guy's... oh it's running tip my time I had it I had it has it come out of his I had it yeah oh it was right there yeah he's the main bad guy he basically basically right. plays the devil god what's his fucking name I forgot what that guy's name is I just had like right you were talking and yeah. I was like oh and Martin then it, the Martian and it just had Bill Bixby Bill Bixby and away. that guy it flickered away mm-hmm. 
someone will someone will know it or someone will google it yeah or i'll remember it like in five yeah. minutes probably um but yeah so he did all the poe pictures like in the early 1960s and then 1964 he did last man on earth which we did a review of not too long ago which if you don't know was the first adaptation of the classic richard matheson novel i am legend uh, which was also made into uh, Ray the, the um, there. Thank you, thank yeah. you. It's yeah. like I had it. I Ray had Walton. it. It's like yeah. thank you. I knew somebody would know. Yeah, Ray two Wal- people. Ray did. Walston. Yeah. Um, yeah, I could see his face, and I was like, oh, his name was right. There. I want to buy Galaxy of Terror on Blu-ray. It's expensive though. I want to own that movie. I, I mean, that's a up. that's a good that's a legitimately. It's good legitimate, movie. good sci-fi horror. It's an Alien One ripoff. But, it's, but Alien it's Two is a ripoff. Thing. The, Alien Two is it's still a, its, it's still its own thing. But the way it looked, I mean, it looked good. Well, that was fucking James Cameron did the special effects. Yeah, some of it looks amazing. Yeah. And then you fucking look, you go back and watch Galaxy of Terror and, you know, all the matte shots and shit and a lot of the stuff that happens in the interior stuff when they're in the fucking alien pyramid. You can see where they got ideas for fucking aliens, for Alien 2. Yeah. Coming out of there. And fucking the equipment and some of the costumes, it it looks good for... A Roger Corman flick looks real good. It's kind of a hokey story. It doesn't matter. It That's didn't okay. matter back then. We were teenagers and we'd watch that shit on fucking Cinemax or fucking HBO over and over and over again. Sneaking fucking, in my days, we were sneaking fucking Everclear and, and drinking that shit. Drinking Everclear and fucking Hawaiian Punch watching that shit. Dreaming about girls. Trying to get laid. Yeah, those are good times. I mean, the thing about movies is yeah. that I don't care how much it costs to make it. I don't care what the plot of it is. I don't care. Just entertain me. That's all. I don't care what genre it is. I don't. You know, obviously, I'm more into horror and stuff like that. But it's just kind of like any movie can be good. You can make a movie on your phone for ten dollars. They could be a fucking masterpiece. Yeah. All it's got to do is enter. Just don't bore me. That's all. Just don't bore me. Sly, did you see Galaxy of Terror, bro? We're at about the same age. We were probably doing the same shit at the same time. We were watching Galaxy of Terror on fucking cable. Trying to get laid, drinking Everclear, in the south. <laughs> Zach fuck. says, "What would you say is Vincent Price's best performance?" I don't. Well, best performance or my favorite performance? Like I said, I probably my favorite film of his is *Mask of the Red Death*. However, um, I think maybe performance-wise, he might have done better in *House of Usher*. Interestingly, his favorite acting performance. And the favorite acting performance of many of his friends and family was actually not in a movie, but was actually a one man stage play that he did in the 70s where he was like um, he was playing Oscar Wilde. And he said that was like his favorite role. And a lot of people said that was his really like his best. I wish I could see it somewhere. I don't think that anyone recorded it because, like I said, it was the 70s. Yes, it's Galaxy of Terror, 1981. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so what was I talking about? Okay, so Last Man on Earth, yeah, we talked about that. Um, like I said, if you don't know, that's based on Richard Matheson's I Am Legend, which was also made into The Omega Man with Charlton Heston, yeah. and I Am Legend with Will Smith, which, meh. But I do like The Omega Man, though. But The Last Man on Earth is actually the closest by far to the novel. Um, I'm still waiting for them to make, like I said, a, a really accurate adaptation of the novel but the last man on earth is the closest um it's fairly fairly close that's to the actually novel. my favorite vincent price movie is last man on earth that oh, yeah I, that I, one's great and i fucking love omega man with with, with cheston charlton heston no i love that movie too and they're they're similar they're they're, they're based on a similar story they're, they're based on the same story yeah it's the same book yeah the same book's book. great too if you haven't read yeah. it i mean i love all richard matheson I, stuff. I, pref- I prefer omega man out of the two but i like uh I like Last Man on Earth. That's closer to the book, too. Last Man on Earth. Yeah, way closer. Yeah. Way closer. Um, Also, ooh, this is another one, too, because I'm thinking of, like, all the movies that he was in. Uh, Also, in the late 60s, 1968, he also did Witchfinder General. Yeah. Which was actually known as the Conqueror Worm over here, but I just call it Witchfinder General. And I think we reviewed that one. Did we review that one together, or did I just do that one? I can't remember. But, man, he was, like, not... Vincent Price was not campy at all in that movie. He was scary as shit because he was, like, completely fucking sadistic. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? He didn't have any of that. I think that was probably like his scariest role because there really seemed no humor in it. He was playing yeah. a real guy like Matthew Hopkins, like a real witch finder. And man, what a fucking bastard. Yeah. Like, but it's still a great movie, though. But let's, that's a great fucking performance. Yeah, he's like, yeah, burn the witches. You subjective, know. He, he mentions the Will Smith version of Mega. Yeah, for you guys that don't know, there was a third movie based on that book called I Am Legend. Which is the name of the this book. Which is the name of the book with Will Smith in it. And when it came out, I, I didn't like it. But I, I think I just saw it being played on a movie channel. And, I, and it, it, I got thrown out of it or something. I didn't like it. But we rented it and watched it again. And I liked it the second time. It's a lot better than I remembered it. Will Smith's good in it. It's not as good as Omega Man. There's just something about Omega Man. Uh, I like that. That's telling that story. The main problem with the Will Smith version is that the mutants don't talk, and that's a big part of the fucking movie. Is that the mutants should be able to talk? And they're just like CGI vampires. Yeah, they're kind of a CGI, I'm like, which has been done before. Yeah, the cross between a vampire and a zombie. Yeah, which I'm like, mm. and and so that meant meant he was by himself in a fucking apocalyptic world, post-apocalyptic world, but there's nobody to talk to him. It's kind of, no. Those things should have been able to talk. They should have been like in Omega Man or in fucking Last Man on Earth. They could talk. They had their own civilization. They saw him as the monster and they wanted him gone. That Which see, that's the whole, I mean, the whole point of the book. That's the this book is what book. always like pisses me off. Yeah. The whole point of the book, I Am Legend, was that he was the monster. He yeah. was the only human left in a world of like quote unquote mutants, which are essentially vampires, yeah. but not exactly like vampires, but similar. So he's the only one left. So he's the monster because he's going around like killing them while they sleep because he's still interpreting them as monsters because he's still interpreting things the way things used to be. He's and it's not the same <laughs> anymore. Like, yeah. and he doesn't understand that he's like the last remnant. Like, you know, his species is gone now. Like, yeah. this is the next one that's taking They've over. they replaced by these new mutants. Right. So I kind of feel like the Vincent Price version is the only one that really did that because that's yeah. kind of like at the end, like yeah. he realizes, oh, I'm the monster. Like, you guys see me as the monster and he dies at the end. Yeah. Which I know Charlton Heston dies, but they did that jesus -y thing and I wasn't really into that, but you know what I mean. Well, it was a self-sacrifice thing. Right, right. right. Through his blood, people would be washed clean of yeah. the disease is what they're talking about. And he created it. He created the disease. Yeah. So he was guilty. He had to die for it. He was a weapon scientist. Omega Man's really, it's not like the book, but that's the best movie telling so far. Yeah. Has been. Although, you can say Last Man on Earth of Vincent Price is the closest to the book I Am Legend. Yeah, by far. By far. It's a good movie. I mean, they still um, change some shit, but it's good movie. It's way closer. Now, I Am Legend with Will Smith, it's a good movie. But a lot of the stories missing, that would have been an excellent movie had the vampire or the mutants, had they talked. And had it been the same moral lesson, that he was the monster all along. That's they did. That wasn't in there. So it was very, Which is the whole point of the that, fucking book. Yeah, it was really That's dumb. That's what made me mad. It was really dumbed down. And it was a shame because, you know, Will Smith was still fucking... That was before he slapped the motherfucker on stage, so he was in good standing. He delivered a good job. He, he, he delivered a good uh, performance in the movie. Yeah, he was it's good just, in it. Yeah, he was good in it. It's just that, man, the script, there wasn't enough story there because the vampires didn't talk. And it would have been a lot better. Like I said, it was, it was just kind of like a straight up like post apocalyptic yeah, monster, monster movie. movie. Yeah. Like it didn't really have any deeper yeah, and that meaning was, to that's, it or that was the problem. any interest to it. And, 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 the and there's a lot of those. Yeah. Like it's you know what I mean. So I think that's why it didn't really have that extra yeah, the, thing the, to it. The book and the book, Last Man on Earth and Omega Man had a deeper message, and it was missing in I Am Legend. They dumbed it down to nothing. It was just dumb. Um, it was dumb that they took it out. But it's still an enjoyable monster movie. Yeah, it just it's wasn't really that. It just wasn't the original story, it wasn't right? The story. And it, it it wasn't that distinctive. Is yeah, what I was gonna say. I liked the Omega Man version because the fucking the, the mutants were psychopathic, fucking psychopathic albino mutants that saw themselves basically they were kind kind of like Extinction Rebellion and Antifa rolled into one. They were trying to destroy everything that was old because it had brought down the world. They were against technology. They were against everything. And they saw they saw um, Neville, who was played by Charlton Heston, as, and he did bring it all down. But they saw him as the past, an evil of the past. And he, he had to be purged and expunged from the earth. He had to pay for what he did. He did eventually. But 
Great flick, great flick. Um, I liked that telling of the story. Had they put that in the fucking Will Smith version, I think the, I think the movie would have been a lot more successful because there'd have been more movie there. Yeah. So um, okay. So where was I? Yeah, Witchfinder General, which, like I said, I've I've reviewed it or we reviewed it together. I can't really remember, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, also in the '60s, he did some comedies. One of these was called Dr. Goldfoot and the Bikini Machine. I have not seen this movie. However, I did see Brandon Tenold's breakdown of it. And I kind of want to see it now because it looks cringy, but also kind of hilarious. Like in the way that the Austin Powers movies were parodying. Except, well, yeah. it wasn't serious because it was a comedy. But, and there was like a sequel to that too. Like with, um, what was called Dr. Goldfoot and the Girl, Bom- Girl Bombs. So... Um, yeah, I might have to, like, do a double feature on those one of these days. Yeah, Camp, uh, camp Guy, I got an Omega Mass shirt for sale. Yeah. Yeah. I made the design. Yeah, it's good. It's just right out of the movie. Yeah. So I'm missing one thing that I wanted, but we really couldn't do it. I wanted that MK760 submachine gun that Neville had. I wanted that underneath it. But with the flashlight tied to it, that would have been great. Camp Guy is talking about the book On the Beach. A good book about nuclear radiation approaching Australia after an apocalyptic nuclear exchange. Man, what a great book that I was. I read a book about that. I read that book. Yeah, I did too. I read it in yeah. school. And they were having death races and shit because they were all going to die anyway. And they were te- televised death races where they were all fucking wrecking their cars and shit. Didn't matter because only people only had like four or five years to live. Uh, SPC says, how do y'all feel about Soylent Green? I think that I movie, got it. I think of that movie every time I see plant-based meats. Yeah, Um it's a good movie. Yeah, I don't like it as much as some of the other kind of sci-fi ones from the 70s, like Logan's Run and stuff. It's slow. It's kind of slow. Yeah. Um, but, and the thing about it is that now that you already know the big secret of it, yes, it Soylent is. Green is made from people, spoiler yeah. alert, um, you know, it doesn't have quite the same impact as it, it ha- used to. The thing is, is that they didn't pull that out of their ass. They were getting that out of a bunch of damn Malthusian writings from people like, UN based stuff and Club of Rome type shit where global warming and overpopulation and they thought that there was going to be a big population collapse and I think they thought it was going to happen in the 90s it never happened because agriculture keeps getting better and better technology and um, everything that was in that movie is shit that they were actually entertaining euthanasia centers Canada's got that now they made that illegal just a couple months ago Um, fucking uh artificial foods you know soy burgers and shit I remember when soy burgers were new when I was a little kid they freaked people out that there was soybean mixed in with hamburger they did they tasted terrible man the texture was not good uh, they probably got it better now because I'm sure that shit's still out there and I haven't tasted that taste in a long time remember those cheap soybean burgers you get off of food trucks and shit mm-hmm. yeah and uh, what else did they talking about just lots of global warming and uh People living in apartments, and the apartment came with women that they called them furniture, and, and massive poverty, and so it was just something that they didn't pull it out of their ass. It was something that writings of the time were worried about. Interesting movie, but today a lot of it would be kind of like old hat, you know, like yeah, okay, weird. Um, so yeah, so also during the 60s, uh, Vincent, like I said, did a lot of TV. I heard somewhere, I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard somewhere that he was on 900 episodes of Hollywood Squares. And I remember watching Hollywood Squares. I don't really remember, Vin- I mean, I remember Vincent Price being on there sometimes, but I don't remember him being on there that much, but I guess he was. He said he was on there like all the time. He was like a regular and he was even on like the last one, like the finale, like from mm. 1980. Which is crazy. But yeah, he was all, like, during the 70s, he was all on that. All that shit's on YouTube. All those, yeah. All those videos. I was like, I, yeah, I need to look shit. that shit up now yeah. because I was like, holy shit. All Maybe the, if uh, I can get one with him and yeah. Paul Lind yeah. and Phyllis Diller, yeah, that would be great. I was, like the three I was of them fucking together. blown away, man. You can even get Joker's Wild and Liar's Club and all that man, shit's I on YouTube. I still love Joker's Wild. Yeah. I don't know why. I just uh, I guess because it had the, like the devil face. Yeah, if you're X generation, you grew up, your parents and shit were watching that or your babysitter was watching that shit. You had to watch it. Price is right. Yeah, my grandma used to watch that. Let's make a deal. 
Yeah, I remember that Monty one Hall with Monty Hall, yeah. yeah. Everybody with the weird costumes. Yeah, on. yeah, yeah. Seeing if they had like boiled eggs in their yeah. purse or whatever. And then later on, Family Feud with old fucking Richard Dawson's fucking creepy ass. Yeah, like fucking sexually assaulting everybody. Sexually assaulting <laughs> all the young women. If any kind it's of like, did you just touch my ass just now? <laughs> and you could tell he was loaded. He'd be dr- he'd be drinking on the fucking talk show. You could tell he was loaded. Yeah. But yeah, so um, but yeah, he was on a ton of sh- uh, of other shows. F Tree, Man from Uncle, yeah. uh, Get Smart. Like I said, the Red Skelton show. He was on there once with Boris Karloff. Um, and as I mentioned, he also was a Batman villain, uh, called Egghead. He was yeah. on there. It was like he wasn't on there like every week, but he was. It was like a regular like recurring role. Um, and he also did like a lot of radio during this time period because I kind of feel like after the sixties, he said that. And I'm paraphrasing, but he was saying that after a time, because the 60s and the 70s, since that brought in, um, you know, more of the kind of more like realistic style of acting as opposed to like the more stagey, if you want to call it that, like style of acting. So he was kind of trying to pivot more to doing um you know more tv more stage work more radio more stuff like that just because in films you know they were looking for more organic more naturalistic type of acting style rather than the more classical acting style that he was used to doing so he basically just like started pivoting and doing other things like i said he always worked he basically worked up until like a year or two before he died even when he was like very very sick and his daughter said that too. It's like he was just always, always working because he just really enjoyed it. And to him, that was, you know, the definition of like not, uh, you know, not going into a slump is like just always be working. It doesn't matter necessarily like what you're working on, but he would do like pretty much anything. So, yeah, so he was in, did all kind of radio like for the BBC and stuff like that. As I mentioned earlier, he did like a Canadian TV show. Uh, called The Hilarious House of Frightenstein, which a lot of people remember very fondly. Um, He was also in The Abominable Dr. Fibes in the early 1970s and the sequel, Dr. Fibes Rises Again. We haven't seen it. We're going to see it. We Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, we saw the first one like a couple years ago because Sophie was here and that's like her favorite movie. Um, And Theater of Blood, which came out in 1973. Now, interestingly, Theater of Blood, that's where Vincent met his uh, third wife, Coral Brown. She was uh, one of his victims in that. And he actually, this is really the only shitty thing that I ever heard about. Like, And I don't even know if it was shitty because I wasn't there and it was the situation. But he did leave his second wife. Well, well he did have he did cheat on his second wife with Coral Brown. Um, and it was kind of like a big, I don't know if it was a big scandal, but they did kind of know about it. And he did end up like leaving his second wife to marry the third wife. Well, but he was, was he was with the third wife until she died. I'm sure the, there was a reason for it. They weren't getting along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and passed. they'd been married a while. It wasn't, yeah. you know, and it wasn't like, oh, they were just married for a year and then he took off with someone else. They'd been married for like 10, 11, 12 years, something like that. So it wasn't, you know what I mean? And, and, it, was, and it wasn't like he ran off with like a fucking 18-year-old or anything like that. She was age appropriate. <laughs> So there's a, so it wasn't so it wasn't anything yeah. like terrible. That was literally like the worst thing that I found. I was like, well, if that's all there is, then ten plus years though, man, that's a long. That's, that's a long what I'm saying. It wasn't like he just yeah. A lot of times, I think it was eleven years he was married times, to his second that's wife. The, that, that's the end of the cycle. I mean, they got marriages that don't last that long. It's you know, they got marriages that don't last five years. A lot of them. So you know, that's they just true. they just weren't getting along. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Um, well, I don't even want to say, like, his daughter, because, okay, so he has two kids. Um, he has a son with his first wife, um, whose name was Edith Barrett, and he had a daughter with his second wife, Mary Grant. And I think the daughter was a little bit mad because, um, you know, she was like, oh, well, you know, he left our mom, like, my mom, you know, for this other woman that he met on the thing. But she, um, I don't know, she got over it. And, and the thing about it was that she... Honestly, other than that, she had nothing but praise for him. She said he was a great dad. He was very, very involved. Like, he used to take her fishing all the time, and she has, like, a lot of really fond memories of him. And um, and she said he just adored his children, and, like, he just loved to spend time with them. So, again, like, he just seems like a wonderful human being. Um, thank you very much. Subjective. A critical hit. I love that. Yeah, I thank you very that. much. He, thank you, thank those you. Those flash bulbs fly. Flash the bulbs flash flashing. bulbs flying. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. 
so let's get into a little bit because so like I said, um, you know, he did continued doing stuff like throughout the seventies. We mentioned earlier, like he worked with Alice Cooper, he worked with Deep Purple. Obviously, he did Michael Jackson's Thriller in the eighties, and nineteen seventy seven. He actually started touring with a one man show like on stage because he started getting back into doing stage acting. You know, a lot of actors like to do stage rather than movies, which I can understand. And it was massively, massively successful and probably one of his favorite roles. And everybody that knew him that saw it said that that was his best role. Like it it showed um, like his emotional range. You know what I mean? This play that he did about uh, Oscar Wilde. But it was like a huge success. So he did that in the late 1970s. But like I said, he continued to do TV through then. He was like he made like guest appearance. He was on like the Brady Bunch and shit like that too so he would do all kind of stuff oh and he also hosted you remember that show that was on pbs mystery that had the edward gory animation like at the beginning like he hosted that for a long time too man i should do some i should watch those i remember those just to put me asleep when i was a kid i'd probably like them now though yeah i mean i remember really liking them well because i I mean when i was a kid anything that had anything to do with vincent price and edward gory i was all on board with that because i I was just watching i still love i still love all i was watching pbs so i could see doctor who tom baker (laughs) well yeah i was fucking justin wilson in the cooking cajun (laughs) oh man i love that too yeah yeah well i liked all the painting Uh, shows too (laughs) i liked all the painting shows too like i liked Bob bob ross and i liked all the um all the ones they had like aimed toward younger kids that were like um like book reviews and stuff like yeah. uh john robbins i think his name was like book bird and yeah he did all because of where he would like draw scenes from the books and shit like that so yeah i thought that was kind of cool but so yeah, prob- can't cook yeah i remember that one <laughs> yeah, can't cook. yeah can't cook is that yeah. dude martin yan is he still around uh, i know I, I, he couldn't be i mean he'd be 90 by now probably, probably. Yeah. well I just, he wasn't that old back then I don't know. I'm just... But I don't, I don't remember. I remember being an old man. But I was young then. But, okay. So I feel like Vincent Price, even though, like, a lot of people had seen him, like, in the movies from the 50s and 60s and stuff like that, I feel like him doing Thriller and um, really helped to kind of endear him to a new generation. And also, obviously, uh, Tim Burton was a big fan. And he actually made, in 1982, he made a short film called Vincent, which is, like, a short animated film about a little boy... Um, who wants to be Vincent Price. You know what I mean? And he actually, like, when Tim Burton was really young, he actually got Vincent Price to, like, do the voiceover for it. And it's it's just, like, a short film. It's, like, six minutes or something like that. Um, But Vincent Price thought that was the coolest fucking thing ever. And that it was, like, better than any... He's, like, it's better than any star on Hollywood Boulevard or, you know, the Walk of Fame or anything like that. He thought that was so cool that somebody was, like, homaging him like that. And so, obviously, when... Tim Burton made Edward Scissorhands in 1990. Um, you know, he kind of repaid the favor and he showed up as the inventor, like in that. And that was really his last. I don't think it was the last movie that he was in, but it was to, like his last big significant role. He was also in the Whales, uh, the Whales of Aug- of August, right in 1987. Um, so yeah, so there was that. And then, so let's talk a little bit about. Um, some of the other kind of stuff because like i said we've talked kind of about his career and stuff like that so let's kind of talk about some of the other shit that he did because everybody knows about all of the acting and the movies and stuff that he did but all of this other stuff they did on the outside maybe sometimes they don't know about so um pretty much from the time he was a kid uh vincent price was super super into art there's a famous story about him that when he was 12 years old uh, you know how some kids, when they're 12 years old, it's like they save up their money so they can buy, like, a, I don't know. What were they buying back then in the fucking 30s or 40s? Bubble gum. A, a soapbox racer or some yeah, shit like yeah. that? Or a, or a hula hoop? I don't yeah. know. But, um, hula hoop 50s, I think. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> That's the only thing I could think of. Um, but he was actually saving up his money so he could buy, um, like, a Rembrandt drawing. He wanted that so bad, and he saved up. It cost $37.50, like, in back then money. Mm -hmm. And it took him... So he bought it, like, on an installment plan. Yeah. Like, he paid a little bit up front, and then, like, he paid it off every year because he wanted it so badly. And I was like, that's pretty awesome. Like, a 12-year-old kid, like, that's what he wants more than anything. A Rembrandt. Is a Rembrandt. It wasn't a painting. It was, like, a... Yeah, it was, like, a... um, It was a lithograph or something like that. Um, I don't know what thirty-seven dollars and fifty cents is in today's money. Sounds it's, like a ripoff to me. I mean, no. I mean, it was yeah. probably like it's probably like a lot of money. 
Yeah. But um. But well, yeah, the he, printing technology back then was probably pretty. I don't expensive. know if it was a lithograph. It might have yeah. actually been a sketch. I can't remember. Right. But um. But yeah. So all through his life, like he was really, really interested in art, and he was very interested too in in like making sure that people that everyone had access to art that was like very very important to him he was really into modern art maybe one of the first kind of high profile people that was into that um i was watching a documentary about him and they were talking to dennis hopper who was like a friend of his and dennis hopper was like vincent price was really one of the first guys he's like modern art it was very very you know you know middle america and shit like that didn't really know anything about it and he's like and i think vincent price was really instrumental in like bringing that to the masses because prior to that it was kind of seen as like this elitist type of thing but vincent price um and his daughter said this too he was very populist he thought that everybody should have access to this stuff that it shouldn't just be like reserved for and that which is pretty cool like coming from somebody that came from money like he did but so it was very very important to him that that everybody see. So him and his wife, they had a massive, massive art collection. And he was actually in East LA at some point. Uh, I think it was in the fifties. And he was really struck by a lot of the students there. Cause a lot of them were, they're very um, low income. Like a lot of them were kind of like, you know, children of immigrants and things like that. And he wanted them to have the same access to art that he had always had the privilege of having. So he donated a whole bunch of his art collection and like a significant amount of money. I'm not sure how much exactly, but it was enough to open the museum and keep it running for a significant amount of time. And as far as I know, the museum is still there and it's like named after him uh, and his wife. And I think that the art it's actually expanded now. I believe it's seven galleries and it has, um, I believe about 9,000 pieces of art in it now. Um, on top of like the ones that he donated originally, um, which I think he donated 90 pieces initially, but he kept kind of, um, you know, uh, doing it. But it's like I said, as far as I know, it's still there and uh, it's still running. So I don't know if he left a thing in his will or whatever, but yeah, he, he gave like a lot of money to that. So he also, um, he would do stuff like, um, do like writing like uh writing grants for you know low income and stuff like that and he was real into um i think i mentioned this earlier like as in regards to the art thing but he got into doing some stuff with sears the big department store which you know is mostly not around anymore but for about 10 years um sears got the idea that like in their i guess like in their houseware section they were gonna essentially like open up like a not a gal well sort of like a gallery but they wanted like real actual artwork like picassos and rembrandts and stuff like that but not you know like more affordable pieces i guess like i said like lithographs and things and they wanted everyone to be able to just buy them to like come into the department store and buy them and Vincent Price was, like, all on board with this. So they kind of, like, collaborate on this for, like, a decade. And Vincent Price, I even saw, like, some clips of, like, little promo materials he'd done for it where you could go into Sears and you could buy... And they had, like, a whole gallery in there. And Vincent Price, like, curated it. Like, he picked out all the stuff. And you could go in there and you could, like, legit buy, like, a Picasso like a little Picasso drawing or something like that for like an affordable amount of money and like put it in your house. So that was like really important to him that people be able to do that, that it was like accessible to but everybody. You could get copies of high art at Sears. Well, they weren't copies. They were originals. Your originals? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what Vincent, Rembrandt. Vincent picked him. Yeah. But like I said, they weren't, you know, some of them were, I mean, obviously they weren't like the fucking, you know, million dollar paintings or That's anything like that. No, 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 no. They were usually like, like sketches or like drawings or something like that, but they were still by the artists and they were original. You know what I mean? But they were just not stuff that was like millions and millions of dollars. Okay. That's I all. didn't know they had anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought just, but they, they weren't copies of, of a painting, of, of a sketch over and over again. No. Okay. No. But like I said, he he picked all the stuff out. Like Vincent Price, like okay. picked all the stuff out. All right. Also, um, I guess like in the White House collection, there are several paintings that were done by like Native American uh, painters, and Vincent Price was the one that kind of facilitated that, like through Sears as well, because that was another thing he was really into, um, like Native American 
issues and particularly like their arts uh, and stuff. And he was actually for a time, he was the head of the government's um, Indian like arts and crafts committee. So like he ran a couple museums and hmm. stuff like that, which was like Native American art and everything. So that was another one of his um, one of his uh, causes that he worked for. So I thought that was like really cool as well. But yeah, that whole Sears thing is like super funny to me <laughs> that he just had that he just had like worked at Sears and you could just like go buy. So I mean, and they did it for like ten years, like up until nineteen seventy one. Is it time for commercials? Um, yeah, I guess. Just so. run some commercials. All right. We'll be back in a minute. All right. Hold on just a second. We're going to run some commercials, and then I'll be yeah. right back in a minute. All right, we're back again. Just did the one string that time. Yeah. Because we just Good. had to refresh the drinks. Fresh drinks. Get yep. the vodka and cranberry going. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so aside from uh, all the art collecting, like I said, which was probably, he was actually on, um, he lectured on art history as well. Um, and he used to show up on that quiz show. Um, what's it called? The $64,000 question, question the 64 yeah, yeah he was on there all the time and they would always ask him like art history questions and he always like fucking mopped the floor with that shit yeah but um well he kind of got here's another thing that they mentioned on because remember at the beginning of the show i said that i watched the mysteries and scandals show with aj benza and it was about vincent price and i was like what could they possibly what dirt could they possibly have on vincent price he just sounds like a lovely man and one of the things they talked about and like i said this is a reach is that because he had showed up on the $64,000 question or whatever that show was called um, and always answered the questions right because they asked him about art history and so he'd like win all this money to give to charity or whatever. Um, you know, when there was that whole um, scandal, they made that movie quiz show about it where, you know, people came forward and they had like a whole congressional committee about like how people were like feeding people the answers and all this other kind of stuff. It wasn't $64,000 question, but I think it was the show 21 that was mainly the one. But I think lo like a lot of the quiz shows kind of got under fire at this time. And I think that Vincent Price actually did have to go and like give testimony that like they hadn't fed him the answers or whatever, because that was kind of a big deal. But I was like, that's not really a scandal. I mean, it was, but it w Vincent Price wasn't like directly involved. He had just happened to be on 
one of the quiz shows that they were asking about. You know what I mean? That's what I mean with that show when they, when they were saying that it was kind of like a reach. They were just like talking about scandals that happened over here. And then Vincent was like, oh, I was kind of in that for like five minutes. But it's like it wasn't really that big a deal. You know what I mean? So there was that. So he would be like on that uh, panel show all the time. And he was always like answering the questions right. And as I mentioned earlier, too, uh, always known as kind of the OG foodie, I kind of feel like. Um, he was one of those guys, and he wasn't one of those dudes that was um, kind of like a food snob or anything. Like, he wasn't like that. Like, he really, really liked fancy-ass food, but he also liked, like, really humble, like, down-home kind of food, too. Because like, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> like, he was real into, like, hot dogs and shit Me like too. that. I like a Right, right, right. So um, him and his second wife, Mary, um, they put out, like, a bunch of cookbooks. Yeah. I think they put out, like, five or six cookbooks or something like that. Like, sometimes they would curate and they would, um, like, collect all the recipes, like, from around the United States, like, recipes that they had liked. And he would be on cooking shows all the time. And um, he was very famously on Johnny Carson one time. And showed them how to poach a fish in a dishwasher. So what? there was that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Which I guess you can do that. I mean, Why the hell would you want to? I wouldn't advise it. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, just because you can, that doesn't yeah. necessarily mean you should. Ridiculous. I saw, like, a little bit of that clip because yeah. um, I saw it on YouTube. And it's kind of funny because, like, they're, you know, him, like, Johnny Carson and Vincent Price are there, like, kind of, you know, cooking. He's getting stuff together. And he has, like, a big bottle of olive oil. And Johnny Carson's like, oh, I got to check if this is fresh and just like chugs it. <laughs> and then I love that Vincent Price is like, he just takes it and chugs it too. And he's like, oh yeah, it's very good. And I was like, nice. I like that he just kind of like rolled with it. It was like really, really funny. Well, whatever Carson did back then, you had to roll with it. He, he, he ran Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, it was just, yeah, they seemed like they were having a really good he time. He could make or break your career. Fucking They were Carson. having a really good yeah. time. But yeah, so like I said, I think some of the um, cookbooks did go out of print. You can still find some of them, some like at used bookstores and stuff, because I know some people that have some. Um, but I think that they did um, kind of compile the, some of the more famous recipes and stuff like that into one big like treasury, like coffee table type book. Like I think his daughter was instrumental in doing that. And I think that came out in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. So you can still like get a new one of it. But if you like look in used bookstores or something, you can still kind of find the old one sometimes. Those of you all who are too young to know this, Johnny Carson was the fucking the original Hollywood gangster. Okay, he ran a fucking night show, uh, a nighttime talk show, and I was young enough, or I'm old enough, that when I was a kid, I used to watch it. It was a great show. Yeah, I used to love Man. It was something about, it was relaxing at the end of the night. You, everything was consolidated in fucking... It was Johnny Carson shutting down America for the night so you could go to sleep. sleep <laughs> That's what it was like, right? But man, he could make or break you. He His fucking clout in Hollywood, was he was rock solid. If you came on his show as any kind of a comedian or singer and he called you over to his fucking... After your act, if he liked you, people just clapped and okay, you're, you're out of here. But if he called you over to sit down with him, you had it made. If he called... It, if he called you over to sit down yeah, at those you tables, knew your shit was tight. Your it's shit Johnny was tight, Carson and you called you. To you sit when he called you to sit to down him next to him, your career was—he <laughs> just sealed the deal on your career. You were going to be a hit, and and that—that's what it was like. People watched that every day. It, it, people in Hollywood watched that, and when they saw Carson call you down to come sit with him, you were going to get a job, big jobs. Yeah, but he's like, look, he yeah, yeah, uh, he, he got called <laughs> over. Getting called over. Well, he yeah. was like, uh, I guess they'd call it a tastemaker. Yeah. An influencer. Yeah, he was an influencer. The original influencer the original was influencer. fucking Johnny Carson. And he was a master, <laughs> man. And then Ed McMahon, ho, 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 ho. He just seemed to just laugh all the time. His job was just to laugh. Yeah. Laugh, yeah, yeah. He would announce it to you, but Yeah, he was an announcer and he just laughed. Mostly he just laughed at shit. Yeah. <laughs> he, he would just laugh at the great Karnak. Remember the great Karnak? That was, that was my favorite, yeah, like, yeah. shtick of his. Carson would dress up as a swami. He'd put this fucking thing on and he'd put envelopes up to his like head and give an answer and then open it and find the question and that shit was fucking funny as fuck, man. You guys can see him on YouTube if you're young. Go look at fucking the great Karnak. you fucking laugh your ass Mr. 88 said, I watch Carson and I'm younger than Tom. Yeah, I remember yeah. like, I used to stay up with my grandma and watch it. Yeah. Camp Guy said, my mother was so prudish she thought Johnny Carson was off color. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. Wow. I remember Merv Griffin, who was a daytime talk show host. I liked him, too. Also, he was the elevator killer. Yeah. 
That was a little kid when. Does anybody know what that's referring to? Yeah. <laughs> or is it just me? The jerk. Was it the jerk? No. no what was it? Man no. with two brains. Man with two brains. That's right. Yeah. It's Steve, Steve Martin. Martin. Yeah. yeah. Merv Griffin actually was the yeah. elevator killer in that. Merv Griffin was cool too. He was, yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, so let's talk a little bit about Vincent's uh, private life then. So as I said, he was married three times. Like I said, it sounds like a lot, but it's not really because the marriages were actually like uh, pretty long, you know what I mean? Um, he actually, his first marriage, he married in 1938, and she was also an actress. He actually met her on a uh, you know, stage, like in a theater company, and her name was Edith Barrett. And um, those two were together for, I think, 10 years, and they had a son. Vincent Barrett Price, uh, who's a columnist and also a poet. Uh, they, so they were married for 10 years. So they got divorced in 1948. And then he married uh, Mary Grant, who was actually a costume designer. And uh, like I said, I think they were married for 11 years. And they were the ones that had the daughter, Victoria, who is, like I said, the one that still curates her, curates her father's um, legacy. You know what I mean? Um so after this point, so 1973, he was, like I said, he was working on Theater of Blood, which is a great movie if you haven't seen it, by the way. Um, you know, I think I reviewed it not too long ago. Either I reviewed it by myself or we reviewed it together. I can't remember. But on the set of that movie, he met an Australian actress named Coral Brown and ended up leaving his second wife because him and Coral Brown started having an affair um, so then he ended up leaving his second wife and marrying Coral Brown. And they were actually married until until their death, until Coral Brown actually died of cancer, of breast cancer, I think she had, in uh, 1991. And then Vincent Price died only a couple of years later. So they were married for, you know, quite a long time. Now, the thing about it, here's something that Victoria said, his daughter, that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, another thing that they brought up on the Mysteries and Scandals thing was that Vincent Price was, during the McCarthy era in Hollywood, was graylisted and actually did not work for a year um, because of his liberal views. But they don't, she doesn't talk a huge amount about it, but she says that after a year, like, I don't know if he had to sign some kind of loyalty oath or some bullshit like that. Um, because then he started getting work again. But he was actually unemployed for a year because he, he wasn't blacklisted, blacklisted like some actors were, but he was graylisted because of that. He was suspected that. of being a communist. Right. Yeah, basically what you said. Right. He, he wasn't, though. I guarantee he would. No. I mean, yeah. he was uh, liberal for sure, and I'm yeah. going to say that he was actually one of the earliest, well, I don't know about earliest, but he was a very early advocate for, um, L, you know, LGBTQ Um so I thought that was like pretty cool too. He actually came out of the seventies against Anita Bryant. That's a bitch we should do a show about. Uh, who was on a anti-gay tear in the seventies, and he came out publicly and denounced her and be like, "Stop being like such a shitty bitch." Nobody you know business. I mean? It's nobody's business. That's what I mean. Nobody's so business. so he was actually like kind of ahead of the game on that. And the thing about it too is that um, his daughter Victoria uh, is gay. Now, when she came out to him, she says that he told her, like, she said he was totally, like, okay. Like, he was totally yeah. supportive about it. So he was very, very, uh, you know, progressive in that regard. And he said to her that, um, that he had had relationships with men, too. So it's pretty much, I feel like it's kind of accepted knowledge nowadays that... Vincent Price was bisexual. Um, at least according to his daughter. A lot daughter. of them were. <laughs> yeah, like, so... They are in the theater, man. A lot of those dudes right, were... Right, uh, right. I don't think that was actually confirmed until fairly recently, but yeah. I think it had kind of been, like, rumored for a long yeah. time that he, maybe he was bisexual, but... Yeah, and there's also... His daughter confirmed there's it. There's also a misconception that all the LGBT kind of movements and rights and that it's new. It's not. That shit goes way back... That was going on in the 1700s, even in France and Europe, the United States, and everything. There were there were many sexual revolutions. It's just that it tightened up in the 50s, and it, but it was I think it was mostly uh, the, uh, the the official line. It tightened up only in the media. According to people that lived through the 50s that I that I've heard interviews with, the 50s was wild too. Just that it was underground. There was bondage going on. 
Fetish well, yeah. clubs. There was all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you just was, had to keep it way they, under wraps. They just kept it under wraps. I I'm, feel like that that yeah. kind of shit's always going on. Yeah, it's it's going just on. that it just depends on how open you can be about it. Yeah, well, like you, now you can be open about everything and nobody gives a shit. But back then you had even to in the fifties they were kind of open about it, but it had to be sideways. Like a good example is superheroes. Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman is a, was a bondage icon. The dude that made the Wonder Woman comic book was was into bondage. You know that's why she had the rope and tied yeah. people up and everything and if you looked at original Wonder Woman comic books she's tying up other girls and stuff this is a bondage comic book yeah <laughs> they they did they did the same shit and they didn't have they they didn't have male pornography all right so what they would do is they'd have men's fitness magazines mm-hmm. that were thinly veiled male pornography all right so you still had plausible deniability yeah. if you bought it. It's like, look, I'm just a bodybuilder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not looking at their glistening pecs. Yeah. Now, some Shut dudes are just bodybuilders. Are. Yeah. But this is well known. You know, me being, I'm, in, I'm into bodybuilding and male fitness. I'm not IBB pro or anything like that. But fucking know the, know the greats, you know. Um, those dudes, including Arnold, evidently. You know, uh, plausible deniability. There are photographs of them dudes out there. They did a lot of nudes. They they sold a lot of nude selfies and shit. Um, they didn't have pornography was kind of illegal, but that was like a thing that they could do on the side. And of course, we know that women don't buy pornography. They don't even not, today. Not really. In not the even same, today. I mean, it's, it's men. Like, All right. Women buy erotica. Yeah, but not pornography. Like written erotica. Yeah, Jenny's written some. Yeah. Um, and the original founder the the grandfather of fucking bodybuilding Eugene Sandow was oh he was at least bisexual it had to have been his wife fucking wanted nothing to do with him because something happened he was giving fucking private shows for gentlemen you know all his muscles and shit and you know when you go to fucking Olympia, you get the Sandow Trophy, and there's fucking Eugen with his fucking little scepter and his sphere and shit. It was about men's physique, you know? What a good-looking man and what a good-looking strong man should look like. Well, and then the first dude that fucking came up, Eugen, he went to Roman and Greek statues and measured the proportions and says, I'm gonna look like that, and this is the standard, and people didn't think it was possible, but he proved that you could look like that. Gay men are going to be the ones that will be first on the fucking male aesthetic fucking kick. It's just, and then it's influencing straight guys. Straight guys are seeing it and going, okay, yeah, yeah, that you should look like that. You know, because they were right. It's better to look like that than to be skinny or overweight or out of shape. It's better to look like a Greek statue. So it was always around. It's just that, like Jen said, plausible deniability. Yeah, like and said, dual purpose. What's that noise? Nothing. Oh, okay. Poop. Is it is it pokey? Yeah, she's right there. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know if something was the matter because mm-hmm. I kept hearing like a noise, like she was uh-huh. choking or something. So it was just kind of dual purpose stuff and plausible deniability. But they, it was going on. Well, I mean, remember in the fifties when there was like yeah. the whole scandal with Betty Page? Yeah. And like the pictures of her. Which are very, very light bondage. I mean, no one yeah. would even blink an eye at that shit nowadays. But back then, you had to, like, sell that under the counter. Like, yeah. you wanted the hardcore shit, you know? Yeah. I mean? Even though she bond- got in trouble for that. bondage was, bondage photos were, were was a way around not showing sex because you couldn't do that. Right. You could show bondage, though. Yeah. Not quite as, but this shit goes back in modern era, you know, even 20s, you know, listen to, listen to, um. Uh, Interviews of Louise Brooks, this cute little actress who uh, was from the United States and uh, ended up going to Germany and stuff. And she would just say that most of the time her handlers were trying to keep an eye on her because they were afraid she was going to end up in the lesbian clubs. And they had lesbian clubs and shit. It was a big rage in the 20s. People forget that there was a big sexual revolution of the 1920s. Yeah, there's one every... Mm -hmm. So so many decades. It's a cycle. It's not linear. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like I said, Victoria, um, his daughter did come out in twenty fifteen 
uh, and confirm what a lot of people had suspected that Vincent Price was probably bisexual. It seems like he was mostly in straight relationships, but because he was married three times, but he apparently did have some relationships with men. Uh, he just followed his heart. Yeah, that's you know. <laughs> yeah. But like I said, a lot of people had thought that yeah. prior to that. But you know, but it was probably a lot more common than he was just kind of the one that said about it. Now, this was yep. another thing that she said in the biography that I thought was really interesting. just honest about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is another thing. And, well, like I said, after his daughter came out um, as a lesbian, he actually joined uh, PFLAG. He was actually, like, an he was an honorary board member of PFLAG, so I thought that was kind of cool. And he, and he was actually one of the first celebrities. I don't think he was the first, but one of the first celebrities to come out and do um, PSAs, like, telling people not to freak out about AIDS. You know what yeah. I mean? Like in the 80s. So yeah. that, I thought that was kind of cool, too. Well, they were trying to get people to freak out on, about AIDS on purpose. They were trying to... Yeah, but he, but he came yeah. out and said, like, yeah. hey, it's, you know, chill out. And so he was, like, one of the first celebrities. There were so many yeah. rumors, man. Yeah, I remember. That you could get AIDS by looking at somebody for too long. or just all kinds of shit. We were scared of that shit. Yeah, crazy. I mean, we were scared of a lot of things mm -hmm. in the 80s. <laughs> Getting nuked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was all... It was, it was terrible. It wasn't terrible, but, you know, it, there was a lot of shit like that. Getting kidnapped. Stranger danger, yeah. that kind of shit too. Um, even though, even though your parents would just let you run around loose, but they were still worried you were going to get kidnapped. Um, but yeah, so one thing that she said in the book that I thought was kind of interesting, that when Vincent was very, very young, she said that you know because their family was very wealthy and you know to a large extent very conservative, um, he didn't really question his beliefs and kind of voted the same way that they voted. And when he was very young, prior to World War II, I'm going to add, he went to Germany and Austria and was kind of like, hey, this Hitler dude, he's maybe got some good ideas. Maybe he, maybe he's going to bring Germany back. You know was what I mean? A, Vincent Price. Yeah, like, yeah. He was thinking, like he was very young then. Yeah. Like he was just... Well, it wasn't just point. him. He was fucking Time Magazine's man of the year. That's what I'm saying. So, so it know. wasn't like super, super crazy. Yeah, they didn't know anything and, about concentration but the, camps. Well, and the thing about, yeah, this was prior to World War II. Yeah. This was, after, you know, obviously, like, after that came out, mm -hmm. everybody was like, uh, yeah, no, that's not such a good idea. But, um, but yeah, and, you know, they, she said, too, that it's like their family, not shitting on their family, but, you know, they were very wealthy, very isolated, um, very white, very Protestant. She's like, so they were, like, kind of anti-Catholic, kind of anti-Jewish. Um, you know, so it was that, and Vincent kind of had those views too, because he didn't really question them like in his youth, but the older he got and like the more he associated with other kinds of people, they said, particularly him hanging out with, um, you know, like Lillian Hellman, Dorothy Parker, like people like that. Um, he kind of, he said that he kind of came to his senses and, you know, was like left all that behind. And she said that, um, that was the one thing that he felt the worst about in his life that he had ever had any um that he had ever had any idea in that direction that like hitler would ever be any good and it's like he just felt bad about like the, his whole entire life yeah, a lot of people thought that though before i know the but happened, i can see how he would have felt really bad about when, that because he dude, seemed like a nice person and when that dude first appeared a lot of people thought that he was um uh, gonna solve a lot of problems you know and, and, and we're not talking about anything about the jews or anything we're just Germany was fucking falling apart. It looked like he was saving Germany and that he was going to save Europe from itself, basically. But that's not how it played out. Attacking Russia was a big fucking mistake, and the final solution was a big fucking mistake. The problem with the Nazis, the Nazis only had one problem. They were fucking real racist. <laughs> they just painted everybody just with... Just a the, tad. Yeah, they, were, they, they kind of <laughs> painted everybody with the same brush. You know what I mean? Uh, just they're like, well, all of these, they, were, they generalized. All these people are our enemies, so we got to get rid of them. You know, which is fucking no. That's not the way we are looking at things. Because they thought the Jews were a monolithic structure that they were all against them. No. In the early days, before a lot of the Jews understood exactly what was going on, you had Jewish people trying to join the uh, that party. Uh, they were patriotic and they wanted to save Germany too, and they wouldn't let them in. You know, because they didn't. You know, the Jews didn't know. <laughs> Well, they didn't I mean, know, and, and, I think, and I think the Germans didn't know too. They were forming their ideas. It just—it's they easy, were a bad influence on each other. They, it's easy to they whip each other. They whipped each other into a frenzy. It's easy to pick on a group that's not like you and demonize them and use that to manipulate people to your own views because it's like, oh, well, they're they're the other. You know, we don't need to give a shit about them. Well, I don't want to get into, get into it too much, but a lot of it had to do with what was happening in Russia. 
Oh, and and the fucking Bolsheviks. They were afraid of Bolsheviks, uh, the rise of communism and the Bolsheviks. But when you looked at what was happening in Germany, Nazism was just a German interpretation of Marx. It was just a, it was German communism. Just it, it was communism with what they call communism with germ, Germanic characteristics. That'd be a good description of it. And the, they had an alliance with the Soviet Union, and then they broke the alliance and attacked the Soviet Union during Operation Barbarossa. It was a blood feud between two competing factions of lunatics, really. <laughs> Mr. 88 says, Ironically, when Schindler's List was presented ad-free on syndicated television, it was sponsored by Ford Motors. <laughs> well, maybe they felt bad. <laughs> I mean, Henry Ford's been dead a long time. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, Tammy says, yeah, she makes the point. She says, Times Person of the Year doesn't mean they're a good person. Just that they had an impact that year. Yeah, they're not they're not advocating that person's views. They're just saying this is the person that made the most that had the most influence. In the early years, though, a lot of people here liked him. There was there was fucking yeah, I know Fritz Kuhn and and Fritz Kuhn and like a, a large section of the American German uh, uh, population, the German Americans were were behind that. They were in the the boons. Uh, There's a lot of shit that was going on. The 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 there were people that didn't want to fight him. Uh, after Pearl Harbor, it's it's not as cut and dried as modern history wants you to think. Um, no, there were a lot. There was a lot of sympathies for them back in those days. It wasn't until they found those camps that's when fucking people was oh okay yeah they're bad because <laughs> that's difficult to deny that you know what I mean. When they found those death camps, that was. Like, yeah, okay, I guess they are bad guys. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, so Vincent Price, it seemed like he kind of got sucked into it for a brief time. But I mean, even by the end of the 1930s, he was like, yeah, fuck them. And that was actually another one of the reasons why he got graylisted, like during the McCarthy era, was because they called him a quote-unquote premature anti-Nazi. Yeah. You're an anti-Nazi, but which is good, but earlier than usual so that's not good which okay but yeah that was one of the reasons they gray listed him um but yeah so like i said he seemed to have snapped out of it like pretty young which is good um and even like in 1950 when he was doing the radio show the saint um very famously he kind of called out uh, against like racial and religious prejudice and one of the points that he made on there which i thought was kind of interesting was that he said you know if if um we're divided by racial lines or religious lines or something like that that just like makes us weaker as a nation which is what our enemies want so he kind of like uh got into that a little bit as well but yeah so like i said also a member of p flag and uh you know campaigned against anita bryant in the 1970s, which, like I said, it might be interesting to do a show about her because she was kind of a shit show. <laughs> she was kind of a horrible person. Was she was like a um? Didn't her family didn't they make orange juice? I kind of feel like she was like an orange juice heiress. And then she was a singer, but then she came out and for some reason the hill she decided to die on was let's all hate gay people. And like she came out and for religious reasons, so she kind of came out against that. So yeah, so Vincent Price like denounced her, which I thought was kind of cool. But yeah, so um, so as I said, Vincent Price, lifelong smoker, which you know, not a lot of people were back then because I guess they didn't realize uh, how bad it was for you. But so he had COPD, um, you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as they call it. And um, also, in starting, I believe, in the 80s, he started developing Parkinson's disease also. So if you see um, Edward Scissorhands, which came out in 1990, um, he's clearly uh, not in great health on that. And, and like I said, he, he was supposed to have a larger role in that, but because his health was so bad, they, I mean, he's basically just in two scenes. So that was like his last movie. Um, but yeah, so he was getting sick a long time. And like I said, his family were they talked about how um frustrated he was that his body was just like breaking down and he couldn't do like all the cool shit they you know they said because he had such uh you know such a vibrant like love of life that he it just made him mad that his body was just like breaking down and he couldn't 
do what he used to do anymore and it just like made him really frustrated and so he would just be always like you know don't get old <laughs> you know what i mean which i mean and he lived a long time like despite having been a smoker and everything like that he lived till he was 82 so you know that's that's not bad um but yeah so he died in 1993 only a few years well, a few years a few days before halloween and uh, he was actually cremated, so, and they scattered his ashes off uh, Nicholas Canyon Beach in Malibu, as he requested. Um, the show that I watched earlier with the couple that went to all these sites around St. Louis, like, they, and they went to Vincent Price's um, parents' house, and they also went to the cemetery there in St. Louis where his parents are buried, his parents and his grandmother. But obviously, like, Vincent Price is not buried there because he was cremated, so, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah. And so I kind of feel like, again, just like when we talk about, we did a show about Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff. We did a show about Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing. And I kind of feel like when you do horror, you kind of like transcend generation. And Vincent Price is another example of that. I kind of feel like Vincent Price is always cool. It's not kind of like, where, you know, there's younger people now, it's like, ah, oh, that shit's dumb, or it's like, that's old, or whatever. It's just like, new generations constantly rediscover the old shit, like Vincent Price, Boris Karloff, all that, and it's just always cool. And that's, I kind of feel like you don't really see that in a lot of other genres. Like, I could be wrong, but you don't really see a lot, you don't see like a huge, you know, subculture of people watching like, comedies from the 1930s like some of them are still funny you know i'm not saying that but i'm just saying you don't get like the rabid fandom the way that you do around like horror icons and you don't see the same kind of like generational um just longevity that you see from these particular like horror actors and actresses and stuff like that you know you see kids now that are into Vincent Price movies that are into Boris Karloff that are in it. And it's, that's crazy to me. Like you don't really see that in a lot of other media. And that's just, I don't know. It's just like really interesting to me, like how that happens. And I don't know if it's just because horror is just like that particular kind of genre where if you're into it, you just want all the horror you can get. And you don't care like where it comes from. I saw a quote earlier. I can't remember who said it, but um, they said maybe it's because horror as a genre is already dated in the sense that, I mean, I guess he was talking about in the sense that it's like, you know, it has its roots so much in like gothic, old gothic castles and shit like that, which are centuries old. So maybe the sense that it's like already old, so it never dates. Maybe that's part of it, but I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't know. I, I just don't know why it happens like that. I mean, I'm glad it happens, but you can't really... I don't know. I, I kind of feel like it, it would be hard to have a career like Vincent Price had and still be remembered, you know, 20 years after he died. He died 20 years ago and he worked almost all uh, all the way up until his death and people are still watching his movies and still talking about his movies. It's hard to believe that he died 20 years ago because yeah. you think he would have died even long ago than that because he was old. He was, <laughs> he was born in 1911. Yeah. Mm. You would think that he would have died 40 years ago. But he lived a long time. He did. And like yeah. I said, he's, and everybody that, um, that I watched on the documentaries that knew him and everything like that were like, he seemed like he, he just was the quintessential example of a life well lived. Like he just got so much out of life mm. and he seemed like he just did everything he wanted to do. I mean, I'm sure he did and I'm sure he wanted to do other things. Cause I think his daughter said, Oh, he was kind of hoping that when he got older, um, you know, he'd be able to travel more and things like that. But because he was so sick, yeah. um, you know, he couldn't do it as much as he wanted, which, you know, was another thing that kind of frustrated him. But, I mean, his legacy is still enduring, like, nowadays. And that's, I mean, you know, what other actors can say that, like, 20 years after they're dead, 30 years after they're dead? Or somebody like, you know, Boris Karloff or something like that who died, like, a really long time ago, too. And it's like people are still watching those movies and, like, talking about those movies. And I just... I don't know. I think that's really cool. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's really cool. Uh, Victor says 30 years ago. So Boris Karloff, I guess, 30 died 30 years, years ago, ago. Something like that. Yeah. Tammy says famous Betty Davis quote was old age ain't no place for sissies. Yeah, that's yeah. true. 
Uh, Jeffy Art said, I believe one of Anita Bryant's granddaughters came out to her and it didn't go well. Yeah, I can imagine. Now I'm kind of like, I need to write that down. I need to show about that bitch. Because <laughs> I remember hearing about her. Wasn't she like an orange? She's an orange juice heiress, right? I never heard of her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was kind of famous like in the 70s. Yeah, but um, yeah, it was it was kind of a big thing. I, I don't want to know. She was, I don't want to say she was like kind of in the whole satanic panic thing because she kind of predated that. But that attitude was kind of like led to satanic panic. You know what I mean? And she was, like, very specifically, like, super, super anti-gay. So there was that, too. The but thing that is, was... though, is that this, this era was an era of radio and television and movies, and that was the only mediums that were out there. No internet. So you had people that had undue influence. If these people were coming up now, they wouldn't, you would never know of them. Yeah, you wouldn't hear about it. Well, because everything is just so, so spread out now. Yeah, which in a way is shitty, but in a way is better. Yeah. Like, I can't decide if I like it better. De- it's better because everything is democratized. Yeah. You, you're not like, being, you can just find whatever you want. You like, you don't you have want. to, like, put up with a bunch of shit you're you don't like. You're not channeled. You're not a captive audience channeled down these corporate fucking television channels. You only had, like, four of them back when we were kids. And they were basically telling you what to believe through that thing it was a means of control and they knew it was it was propaganda now it's real hard to propagandize the public I mean look at them now man the fucking corporate news channels and fucking Hollywood they're, they're losing their shit because they don't have the traction that they used to have well, and that's like where I their said, money the, was the means from. of production is yeah. available to yeah. many many more people now yeah. like I said you can shoot a fucking movie on your phone yeah so, which is great. I mean, that's fantastic. <laughs> Americans are kind of raised to believe that we have freedom of press and that we never really had any of that. Basically, all your, pretty much most of your, especially news channels in Hollywood after World War II ended up becoming mercenary forces for the fucking federal government. They had They would pay them to put out certain messages and that went on for a long time and it, and it definitely happens now you know they're all just kind of merged in with the government and the military industrial complex and the congressional complex it's all just one thing but the advent of the internet just broke the back of all that you know and now the ruling class can't put out orders to anybody and they can't keep blinders on you you can now if you're wise and, and you're paying a lot of attention you can tell who's lying to you and who isn't you know and uh, they're losing their shit. The rich people are, because they 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 ran this system for fucking hundreds of years. <laughs> but it really got bad. Fucking but World World War Two. That's that's where the United States got kind of went wrong. I mean, the thing about it is that the only thing is that you know back in the old days, like. You know, you only had so many channels, so everybody would see the same shit. So you'd, like, go and, like, everybody could talk about the same thing. Now, it's kind of like... And I'm not complaining, because I actually do like it better nowadays. But now, like, for example, like, I go to work, and they're talking about, like, some country singer or something that was on TV, like some sporting event or something. And I have no fucking yeah, no, idea what they're talking about. about. Yeah, and it's like, and I'm sure if I talked about shit I like, yeah. they would have no idea what I was... Because I was talking about, like horror movies the other day because there is a guy there who is really into horror movies but everybody else oh I don't really like horror movies and I'm just like okay well last we're, time we're, we're done saw, talking then, the last time last time I saw television was probably a couple months ago I went down to the Oasis that down biker bar and all those old people in there were watching t- television on the big screen television and they were and it was a television program that showed YouTube clips and of people doing crazy shit like America's Funniest Home Videos. They had that. They had a little bit of sports ball. And then they had some other shit on. And it t- television is dumber now than it was when I was a kid. That's how dumb it is now. The only things I it's watch like TV 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 is yeah. like if Gordon Ramsay has a show, yeah. I'm going to watch that. But I don't, yeah. I don't watch it on live TV. I just watch it on Hulu like the yeah. next day. And I can't believe people still watch that. I don't know who's watching that shit, but I mean, I guess some people are dumb. You know, but I don't, TV was always dumb, though. Yeah, it, I, it feels even dumber now. I don't know. I yeah. think it was always dumb. <laughs> 
In some ways, I feel it's less dumb, but then in other ways, it's more no. dumb. No, daytime talk show, the daytime programming is dumb, beyond dumb. And it's about the internet, most of it. Well, yeah, because they yeah. realize, well, everybody's looking at that, yeah. so we might as well farm some content from there. It's like, right, right. Well, because they can't afford to like employ people to like actually right. come up with original content, so they're just gonna like fucking go scrape some shit from that's already been done. It's pitiful. I, mean? I don't think television is gonna last much longer. It's not the source of the entertainment; it's commenting on the source of entertainment, which is the internet. That you know, it's over then. You know. Jeffy Art says, I feel horror content is a great window window into the era it's produced, but in a way that's insightful. That's actually like a really, um, that's a really good comment because the thing about horror is that it always, it always kind of like um, codifies, I feel like, and expresses the anxieties of whatever era that it comes out in. And in that way, I think it's like the most... It's probably the most instructive genre to watch from any era because you can always see what the overriding concerns of most people of that era were by watching the horror movies. Not so much watching the other stuff. Like sometimes you can glean some stuff from the other um, genres as well. But horror, because it's, you know, by its very nature, it's exploring, you know, darker issues like the dark side of things and can go places that other genres don't. Um, I feel like it's a really good, I don't know, it's just, it's just like a really good way of, um, sussing out whatever people were worried about in any particular, I mean, you know, and the first thing I thought of, I don't know what, I probably just thought of this cause I was watching some shit the other day, but, um, you know, I mean, look, look at all the like eco horror, for example, that came out in the 1970s and that came out as a direct result of silent spring you know that book that came out about like the ddt ddt and like um you know all the poisons and the water and everything and so immediately like all these movies come out about like oh we're poisoning the water with mercury and like these fish are growing giant and like now we have mutated bears and giant bunny rabbits and all this other kind of stuff and i you know the same thing kind of happened with the big bug movies in the 1950s everyone was like worried about radiation and all that kind of stuff because they didn't really understand it and so you know now we have giant tarantulas and giant crickets and giant this and that so it's just like really i don't know it's just like really interesting and now i'm kind of interested to see like in 10 years, 20 years, it'd be interesting to look back at the horror movies that came out during this era um, to kind of see like what the anxieties were, you know, because I kind of feel like horror movies are really the best distillation of that. I don't know. I kind of feel like the horror movies in the last few years have just been kind of all over the place, but in a way that a lot of the media is because it's just... Now it's just kind of tailored to everyone else's like niches and different subcultures and things. So it's not like, I don't think it's commenting on, I don't know, like mainstream society as a whole, because I don't know if there is such a thing anymore because everything has been so fragmented. And like I said, that sounds like a bad thing, but I don't think it's a bad thing. John is saying that we both reviewed Theater of Blood because Tom kept on going about going on about Vincent disguising himself as a gay guy. That 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 yeah, I remember that. So, well, Theater yeah. of Blood was Theater, the one yeah. where he like was the Shakespearean actor that yeah. all the critics like shit on him because he was super hammy. Yeah. So he said, "Fuck those bitches! I'm gonna kill them all." And yeah. he was gonna kill them in like really like over the top ways. It's a great movie. It's yeah. super fun. I, I vaguely remember. It's vaguely, super fun. I vaguely remember me talking about him dressing <laughs> as a gay. It turns out he's just coming out. He's not. It's not a disguise. His straight his straight persona was this guy's the gay no I'm just kidding but uh, yeah yeah fucking Price was the shit man he was good I know good. I was like yeah and like the more I find out about him it's just like like I said not only was he just a great actor who was in like some fucking yeah. classic movies but he also seemed like a wonderful human being which is always nice to find out I didn't know there was a Fives part two I'm gonna see that now yeah yeah cause yeah, yeah we've seen the first one I don't yeah. think I've ever seen the second one now that yeah. I think about it I think some I think somebody mentioned it before in on another show when when somebody brought that up that that part two was better. I don't know. Maybe I think that's what he said. That's except, usually not the case, but sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's true. Mister eighty eight said our grandchildren will think we were terrified about sand, snow, tree, mountain sharks with five heads because <laughs> of all and Ouija sharks. Don't forget Ouija yeah. sharks. Yeah, because there are a lot of shark horror movies. Zach says, a lot of horror from the last decade to me has been existential. 
like hereditary yeah i kind of noticed that too like there's definitely a vein there of that well because like i said because nowadays because the means of production has been so democratized it's hard to really make a statement about oh everybody in this society like i said back in the 70s it was easy it's like eco horror was like a big thing everybody was worried about big ants big rats well everybody was worried yeah. about like environmental horror oh my god we're poisoning our water supply and shit big like foot. that which we were <laughs> yeah. so you know what i mean um so i get that that people were like worried about that but nowadays it's because there's like little pockets of people with different concerns like working on stuff i don't know if it's the same like overarching but it's still like i don't know i still i still feel like it's instructive to like watch it though because it always it, it's kind of like a a window into our collective psyche and our collective anxieties you know what i mean uh mr 88 said santa jaws overweight north pole sharks too i keep meaning to watch that maybe we should do that for the christmas show because I keep seeing it, like, coming up when I was, I'm like, Santa Jaws. That really sounds like something I need to be watching, but I don't know if I want to or not. <laughs> We've seen, like, enough shitty shark movies. Don't watch Ouija Shark, by the way. Nah, it's terrible. It's terrible. No. It's a great idea. It was a great idea. It was just like... If you want to see a great, bad movie, you see Velocipaster. It's a fucking, it's a fucking masterpiece. That is definitely the Citizen Kane of bad movies. Yeah, Velocipaster. And I'm not even being facetious no. when I'm saying that. It's, it's a great movie. It's super fun. It's a great movie, yeah. I enjoyed it immensely. I want to see it again. I got it. <laughs> don't I have that? I don't know if you have it. It's on, t well, it was on Tubi. I don't okay. know if it's still on there. Oh, yeah. But it's okay. been on Tubi for like as long as I can remember. It Velocipaster. Might, it might still be on there. Yeah. Jeff Yard said, YouTube is today what broadcast was at the dawn of the internet. Streaming services are what cable and premium channels were. Yeah, yeah I guess so. I guess Evidently, so. the um, all the uh, streaming services are going to collapse. It's all going to end up being Netflix. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I've been hearing through, like, Midnight's Edge and stuff. Because Disney is probably going to back out of Disney+. Plus. A lot of these little fucking CBS fucking streaming services, they just... There's just too fucking many of them, man. Well, I kind of feel like they'll probably yeah. just, like, have to conglomerate. They have to fucking well, come because, together. Well, yeah, the thing about yeah. it is that it's going to be, like... Well, when cable first started, I remember bitching because they'd always sell it to you in packages, right? It's like, well, you have yeah. to have these hundred channels or whatever. Yeah. And, it's like, you know, 85% of them you never watched. You know, it's like, yeah. I don't I don't need fucking religious channels or ESPN. Yeah. or it's, I don't watch any of that shit. But it all came with the package. Yeah. So I kind of feel like it might go in that direction again. Because now it's almost like the opposite problem where it's just kind of like there's 40 bajillion small Str streaming, streaming server. Like everybody has their own streaming app. Yeah. But it's like all the shit you want isn't on the same one. So you have to have all these little ones. And like some of them are cheap. They're only like $5 a month. But that adds up. Yeah. I mean, I have... How many streaming services do we have? We have Netflix. We I have got BritBox. We have Amazon Prime with the, with the BritBox add-on. Yeah. Um, I have Shudder. I have Hulu. Um, and I have HBO Max. That came with my phone plan, actually. And then there's, like, free ones, too. Like, you have, like, Tubi and Freebie and Pluto and stuff like that where you can watch it for free, which is nice. But I thought we paid for one more. Yeah. I can't remember what it is, though. Well, I mean, I pay for HBO Max, but like I said, that came with, that came with my phone plan. HBO Max is good if you're into, like, classic movies, because they have a fuck ton of, like, the classic movies that everybody needs to see. They have, like, pretty much all of those. I don't know so much, and they have, like, good series and stuff, too, but, like, I don't know so much about new stuff, but they're good for that. So I like them for that, because I like a little, watching a lot of that, but, you know. And the thing about it, too, is that I really like having Shudder also, but that's also super cheap. I think I only pay $59 for a year, you know. But Tubi has a, a lot of good shit, too. You just got to... The problem with Tubi, and I'm not going to bitch too much because it's free, their search engine blows. Yeah. You can't... Because, look, Shudder, they have collections. It's like, hey, I want to watch a Giallo movie. Hey, I want to watch a creature feature. Like they have them all categorized. I still think Shutter is still one of the one of the fucking coolest ones. It is, yeah. Yeah. But Tubi, we got Shutter for five bucks, didn't we? Yeah, it's yeah. like I said, I pay fifty nine dollars a year. Yeah. So which is nothing. Yeah. Um, and it's great. They and they add new movies, new movies, old movies, like every week they add like yeah. a handful, and they have like a good. 
combo of like old shit and new shit and foreign shit. They have like everything. Oh my god. Damn, oh, a poster fell down. Poster fell off. That falls down off the map. Yeah. But um, the, the thing about crazy. Tubi though is that they have like a bajillion horror movies and they have like a fuck ton of good ones. But there's no way they they're not categorized, and they don't that you can't like. You can't search for them, like, out, like you can search for them, like, if you know the title, but they can't, like, oh, list them alphabetically or list them according to, you know what I mean? So it's really, really good. So you have to sit there and scroll through, like, thousands and thousands of movies, like, looking for a good one because they're not in any particular order, which is crazy. I really wish they would sort that out, but like I said, they're free, so I can't complain too much. Uh, Mr. 88 said, I only have Amazon and Disney Plus, so I don't stream much. I feel that streaming is crazy dirt cheap, fabulous value. My DVD collection costs more than a nice brand new car. Yeah, when you think about it, I mean, even if you have multiple streaming services like we do, it's not horribly expensive. Like I said, I pay for Amazon Prime. You pay for Netflix. I pay yeah. for Shutter. I pay for Hulu. I think Hulu is like nine bucks or something. Um, and HBO Max, my that comes with my phone plan. My phone plan is $65 a month and it just comes with that. So it's like really when you think about it, it's really not that expensive because there's a fuck ton of movies on there. I mean, more that I could ever watch. I can. It's so many that I can't decide. You know what I mean? And I'm just sit there scrolling through, going, I don't know, I don't know what I want to watch. You know what I mean? There's too much shit on there. Anyway. There's too, well, that's what I mean. It's like it. We're kind of like spoiled for choice now. Yeah. Like back in the old days, it's like one there was enough. this one movie and you wanted to see it. And it was like this big deal. Yeah. But now it's just like we have all the movies and it's like now I don't even know what I want to watch. I'm like yeah. scrolling through there for two hours and I can't think of anything and then I just go to bed. And some of the new series you look at it and go like, yeah, I don't want to see that. And it looks like it's a good series, but you're just you just don't care. There's too fucking many of them. Well, the thing about it, I'm always like reluctant to start a series because I'm like, man, what if I really get into that? And then you gotta watch and then that. I'm gonna be stuck for like five seasons, like. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, that's kind of, so that's kind of why I'm like hesitant to like start new ones, but, cause I have so much shit I have to watch still. It's rumored that the fucking, they're finally going to do a good Conan series and it's by the Robert E. Howard fucking, um, what do they call it? Not the fund, but like trust or yeah yeah the guys that, and, and the dude that's in charge of Robert E. Howard shit is a Robert E. Howard fanatic uh, he pulled it out he pulled it away from uh, a couple of the services because he said nope that's not Conan so he just p took it from him he, he doesn't care about the money he took it away from uh, I think Google was one of them they were going to do it and I think that Netflix was going to do it but they were going to fuck it up. They were going to basically make it like He-Man or some shit. He's like, no, that's not what we're talking about. It's going to be real Conan, not bullshit Conan. Evidently, somebody's picked it up. And it's going to supposed to be real good. Or the the, 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 the Robert E. Howard Association, the, 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 the trust fund or whatever, has has, uh, is, is, is gonna, is, is, has approved what it is that... The, um, what this... Uh, platform is going to do with it it's going to be high end and it's going to be kind of true to the books not so much the milius schwarzenegger conan one it's going to have that in it that kind of motif you know like something out of a frank Frazetta painting but it's going to be like the books it's going to be good and the fucking comic books the uh um the marvel comic books from the 70s and 80s it's going to be like that yeah there's a lot of shit I didn't know about that. In the original book, you know, Thulsa Doom, he was a sorcerer, but he had a skull head. And they were going to make a fucking movie about that, but the original movie with fucking wasn't going to be, uh, what's his name, fucking, um, he was going to have a skull head. Well, they were going to make toys and everything for the Conan 1 movie. And once they saw that bitch and it was fucking rated R, they are like, kids can't see this. We're, we're not going to sell any of these, these toys. The, the work that they were going to do for Conan ended up becoming He-Man. That's why Skeletor has a fucking skull head. Yeah. Because originally Thulsa Doom had a skull for a head. I didn't know that. Yeah. And fucking well, He-Man was He-Man well, was, no, he was just Conan with blonde hair. It was the same, same thing. Oh my God, Mister Eighty Eight! I just, I just had a flashback. Eighties yeah. Cable was an endless circle of Grease Two. Yeah. 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 The pirate movie. Yeah. And Fraggle Rock. Ad I don't remember Fraggle yeah, Rock. Yeah, I remember. You don't remember Fraggle Rock? I don't Rock? remember the movie, no. No, it's not a movie. It was a show. 
Okay. It was Jim Henson. Vaguely. It was on HBO. Vaguely. Oh my god, I loved Fraggle. I also remembered shit like fucking Adventure. Wembley in the Terrible Tunnel. Adventures in the episode. Forbidden Zone with a young fucking um, uh, what's the little redhead that was from uh, 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 fucking Breakfast Club. Uh, Molly Ringwald. Molly Ringwald. Remember that? Remember uh, Space Hunter? I think it was called Space Hunter and the Adventures in the, Brazi- in the Forbidden Zone. I definitely and remember fucking... Grease too, which I've yeah, seen Grease, so many times time. that I've memorized it. And then the pirate movie, Galaxy of Terror. I really liked the pirate yeah. movie. Time after time, they used to show that yeah. all the time. Um, what was the one with uh, shit? What was the one with Chevy Chase and Goldie Hawn that was like a murder mystery? What the fuck was the name of that thing? Uh, I wanted to like Clue? rewatch it. No, 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 no. That was Tim Curry. Although they showed that a lot too. Oh man, we should review Clue one of these days too. What the fuck was the name of that movie? Burgess mm-hmm. Meredith was in it too. He had a python named Esme. Oh, I remember. I don't think I saw it. Oh, it was good. I mean, I remember it being good. I'll remember it in a minute. Uh, Zach says. I watched boys movies, man. That was that wasn't a girl or a boy movie. It was just a yeah. movie movie. Don't be weird. <laughs> no, I'm just, I just remember what it was, what, what, what I was watching back then. Horror movies, it, it, action movies, and... Uh, yeah, I watched all that, too. Yeah. And I watched she, pretty much everything. Yeah. If it had titties and, and it was after 11, I'd be, I was going to stand up and watch that. Remember that? Yeah. It was fucking funny. It's just a different world back then, man. Well, it was hard to see titties back yeah. then. Yeah. Now it's, like, yeah. super easy to see titties. Yeah. It's, you watch. You were gonna watch. You, you almost were, like don't value the titties yeah, because yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, can just see yeah, titties yeah, whenever titty you want to. Yeah, just it's, go on Instagram. It's titty overload. Titty I mean, fucking, titties we're, everywhere. I mean, we're gonna stay, stand up and fucking get get the shit scared out of us for fucking Friday the Thirteenth Part Two because you can see some titties in it. That girl going out going out to fucking skinny dip at night. Remember that? They're like, yay titties. Yeah, yeah. She's gonna die too. You know, just yeah. It was a fucking weird time. You show your titties, you get killed. That's how yeah. it happens in horror movies. The 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 <laughs> the moral of fucking the moral of fucking Friday the Thirteenth is that if you have sex, you get killed. That was the moral. Well, yeah. Well, that <laughs> the was the moral, moral of the story. that was the moral of a lot of slasher movies. <laughs> the, yeah. Well, I think that started yeah. that started with sex, that started with Halloween. Yeah. Because uh, you know Jamie Lee Curtis was like the virginal good girl, and she yeah. was the final girl. She was yeah. Lord. She yeah. She lived because she didn't have sex. Because the thing about it was, I mean, there was slashers prior to that, like Black yeah. Christmas. Yeah. But Black Christmas, the final girl in that, she was not a virgin because the whole one of the whole plot points in that was that she was going to have an abortion and her boyfriend yeah. was mad. Okay. So, I feel like that started with Halloween. You know. Then there was the then there was the fucking Canadian version. A fucking Friday the Thirteenth, Thirteenth that didn't have any fucking killing or blood in it. Fucking Terror Train, remember that one? Yeah, yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis. Was yeah, there. like she was in that one too. Terror yeah. Train. Yeah. Okay, because I like that one too. Yeah, it was like it was set on New Year's Eve. Yeah. We just reviewed that not too long ago. Yeah. If you remember. Yeah, it wasn't scary at all. No, not really. It scared me when I was a kid, but it's not scary at all looking at it. Plus, now. David Copperfield was in it. That's right. Doing his fucking lame ass magic magic tricks, kind of get trying to get laid. Yeah. Yeah. That was super fun. I had forgotten he was in it. And then we watched it again. I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot this motherfucker was in this movie. Dude, Mr. God. 88 said, yeah. Uh, Jen and I had the same cable service because every time she talks about cable movies, I had the exact same rotation, right? Yeah. It's Yeah, it was the same. Um, do you remember the small 5 by 6 inch cable program catalog that came each month? Yes, I do remember that. And it was, yeah, like the little yeah, HBO yeah, yeah, one. Yeah. It, was, it was like that. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And you would look. It was like a little drink menu. It was a little bit. <laughs> like well, that's the thing. Like, I guess because it was early days and yeah. they didn't have the rights to, like, any big movies or anything like that. Because it wasn't like now where it was just, like, a pipeline where it shows in the theater or whatever. And then it, like, would come to video. Like, they didn't even have – shit would come to video, but it would be, like, years later. So they kind of had to just show kind of more obscure movies or movies that were kind of, like, not all that famous or something like that. But they showed but they showed the same ones, like, over and over. So that's how I ended up seeing Grease 2 probably, like, 50 bajillion times because it was always on. Yeah. And the same thing with, like, Time After Time. Like I said, not complaining because Time After Time is a fucking awesome movie if you haven't seen it. It came out in 1979. Malcolm McDowell's in it. Yeah. But um, I'm still trying to think of it. What the fuck was the name of that? What the fuck was the name of that one with Chevy Chase and Goldie Hawn in it? I don't know. God damn know. it. It was like a it was like a murder mystery. The fuck then there was, was a lame movie? ass movie called fucking Doctor Detroit that I remember. The, the oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was Dan Aykroyd. Dan, Dan Aykroyd. Aykroyd right? yeah, yeah, I remember Detroit. that one. I remember that one. Mister Eighty Eight said they usually played the same movie uh, twice per day. 
on three different days each week. Yeah. They would, because like I said, they didn't have that many. So it's like yeah. they'd always have. So you turn it on and be like, oh, hey, look, the pirate movie's on again. <laughs> and like, I would yeah. sit there and watch it again. I didn't have anything else to do. You know what I mean? Uh, Jeff Yard said, young people will never know the struggle of trying to watch scrambled channels for boobs on cable when the yeah. parents are out for the, the night. fucking line going like that. Yeah. And you're like, here, wiggle, wiggle the antenna. <laughs> It didn't work. I think I saw a nipple. <laughs> what would really frustrates you is that for a second it get real clear. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there it is. That's nipple. I think yeah. whoever it was yeah. that was like running that shit was probably like, here, let's, let's give him a charge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we're going to like, because yeah. that's what I would do if I worked, yeah. if I worked there. <laughs> give the teenage boys. I don't like, know what they, like what, what you were fucking straining, straining to watch because it, that was porn, but it was censored porn. Yeah, they, they, it was like soft core. It was porn like very, or, very soft. Right, course, like, it yeah. wasn't like it wasn't hardcore. They weren't well, showing hardcore porn on TV. No, this isn't France. Even for scramble, sake. even scramble, or they Italy or wherever they yeah. used to do that. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you had to go to VHS to see the real thing. You had to go in the stinky, sticky back room mm. through the curtain. Yeah, the bead curtain. Censored all right. porn. All you do is saw some dude's ass bouncing up and down. <laughs> That's what they censored. The girl's face. Dude's ass in the girl's face. That's it. Some titties. <laughs> this is big area. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, get out of the way, man. It was. Shot, shot, they, they cut all the other shots out. <laughs> yeah. Get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. All right. So I guess we're going to wrap it because yeah. it's 1030 and I really got to go to bed. Yeah, yeah. So because uh, I got to get up early in the morning to go to work. But thankfully, this weekend is a three-day weekend, so I'm looking forward to that. That yeah. should be fun. We'll get to do the haunting Monday show, like, and I'll actually have all day to get ready for it, which is nice. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, all right. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this show, which was mostly about Vincent Price, other than all the millions of sidetracks that we went off on. Uh, but you know, what else is new? Oscar and Misty are watching us. On, oh, are on they? Really? T- yeah. Oh, that's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> look at look at the look, weird colors. Yeah, weird colors. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Misty, you're on. <laughs> we put Misty on. Mr. 88 says, the yeah. first primetime ass had to be Dennis Franz. Why? Yeah. I know, right? Maybe they thought if it was, like, too sexy an ass, then everybody would, like, call for more of that. So they didn't want people to, like, have more man ass on TV. So they're like, let's put Dennis, Dennis Franz's hairy ass up on there. Then everybody would be like, no more butt, no more butts, please. No more, no more man butts. Let's just keep it with the, with the lady butts. You know, I don't know. I'm getting Chuck Norris videos sent to me by... Like a little swole. Yeah, I figured it. Yeah, a little swole. As soon as you said Chuck Norris videos, I knew yeah. who was sending them. Yeah. <laughs> I know who sends you all the things. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed the show about mostly about Vincent Price. Um, you know, and this was a fun show to do because I fucking love Vincent Price. Like everybody, who doesn't love Vincent Price? Come on, he's the, he's he's the man. He's awesome. All right. So um, the next show, obviously, will be Friday night, which is the sidetrack show. So we'll have some drinks and talk to you guys about whatever bullshit we feel like talking about <laughs> like usual uh so yeah so have a good rest of your evening you guys have a good day tomorrow and we'll see you guys again on friday night good night